Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 201. So glad you could join me from our alternate location here in the Woodlands, Texas. I have a totally separate studio set up, and it looks like it's working perfectly, so that's good news. Uh, before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this because we love poetry, and I know you do too, so please do click the like button and share. Make sure you're subscribed. Ring the bell for notifications. Anything you can do to help poetry spread around the internet would be much appreciated. Now, um, we're going to start out like we usually do with um, our Poetry Spawn Poet. And we have a wonderful poem from Sunday, Let's Kiss, by Angelica Whithorn. And Angelica is here right now. Hey, Angelica, how are you doing? Hello. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you. So tell us uh, before we, uh, what inspired this poem? How, how did you end up writing it? it? It sort of combines a whole bunch of new stories at once, which is always fun to see. Uh, so where did the inspiration come? Yeah, I feel like whenever I write a lot of poems about the news and whenever I do, it's never just one news story because it's never one news story that we read. It's always five at a time scrolling through this, this, this. There's always more. So I find that a lot of my poems take little pieces of the news and kind of see how they can interweave and say more about our current events. Um, this particular poem was actually inspired originally by a tweet. So there's a tweet about um, the orcas are actually taking down boats and it says, what if we like, what if we kissed while the orcas were taking back the ocean? And I love that line. And I sometimes find that tweets are like little poems themselves. So that inspired me. And as I read more news for the week, I kind of just added more um, to that original idea. Yeah, well, it's so fun to have. I mean, you know, the news is so negative all the time, um, of course, for, for good reason, because there's a lot of negative things that happen and because negativity sells newspapers and gets people paying attention to the news. And so yeah. combining it, though, to make it a poem, um, you know, that, that has a sort of positive spin, even while we're being negative, is something that's that's different. And, and it felt really refreshing to, to me to read. Is that something you started to do or um, is it just how, that the, the, the course the poem happened to take? Yeah, I think maybe that's what drew me to the tweet. I think I always love when, although it can be devastating, the earth kind of fights back. Um, and the kind of, we get we get what's coming sometimes. Um, so that in some ways that seems kind of celebratory to me. And then I also love the ideas of, you know, all of these bad things are happening all the time, but in the midst of that, there's little things that are going on as well that we can celebrate and love and kissing is just one of those things. Yeah, well, it was a great poem to, to be able to share uh, on Sunday is the daily poem. Do you want to go ahead and read it? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's kiss. Orcas are taking back the ocean. Let's kiss. Social learning for social good. Sailed over our heads. Let's kiss. When serve the people sounds more like suppress the people. Judges, justice, just us, we're on our own, let's kiss. Under the rainbow, pot of gold, no, an unhoused man. No, 500,000 unho unhoused men. Let's kiss under the rainbow until we turn to gold. Then maybe we can be of use. The sea is full of titanic revenges. Did you know dollar bills can't produce oxygen? Fuck, we're all going under, and we aren't coming up. Let's share the last of our air. Let's kiss. More ghosts to dance with ghosts in the deepest depths. My ghost asks your ghost for a dance. They go in for a kiss. Bezos, no, Beso, no, Bisu. What I'm trying to say is let's kiss rich until we're poor. Let's kiss ourselves to rags. Piles of rags, Xi'an's shiniest shipped out to overseas on ships orcas are striking down. Secondhand fashion shows in the dying coral reefs. Guilt is our style choice of the season. Chic and shit out of luck. Fuck, we're all going under. Let's kiss. Yeah, beautiful poem. Thanks again for sharing that. It was Let's, Let's Kiss by Angelica Whitmore. Thanks, Angela, for, for sharing that poem with us and for joining us today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to take a quick break and go to our main guest. Virgil Suarez is here. Um, so let me just uh, put on a little bumper music and uh, we'll take a quick break. Angelica, I love that poem.
And we're back. Thanks so much for your patience. Like I said, Virgil Suarez is uh, our guest today. Virgil was born in Havana, Cuba in 1962. At the age of, age of 12, he arrived in the United States. He received his MFA from Louisiana State University in 1987. He's the author of 11 collections of poetry, most recently American Chernobyl, which is right here, a beautiful self-published book, which is something we're going to talk about, uh, doing it that way. Um, let's see. He's been taking photographs on the road for the last three decades. When he's not writing, he is out riding his motorcycle and down the blue highways of the southeast, photographing disappearing urban and rural landscapes. His 10th volume poem, the one right before this, was the Painted Bunting's Last Molt, and that was published by the University of Pittsburgh Press in 2020. Um, he lives in Florida, and here he is, Virgil Suarez. Hey, Virgil, how you doing? Hi, Tim. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Be yeah, to chat. it's my pleasure to have you. You know, I've been a fan of your work for a very long time. The first, that Axiom of the Outsider, which is the last poem we're going to read, was published in the very first issue of Rattle that, yeah. uh, that I'd worked on in 2004. So it's been quite a bit, but it's great to finally meet you in person. And, and also the poem has had, you know, a, a, re, a rebirth, I guess. I don't, th I don't think that poem was published in, in book form. I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is like the first time uh, the, that, the, uh, that the poem is, is in fact published. So, yeah, I've well, always been a big fan of Rattle, you know. Yeah, from, well, we're, we're great, happy to have you. Do you want to start out reading a poem um, sure. from, from the book? Um, I'm going to read you a, a poem that arrived a little bit later. Uh, and, I, and, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about how this book got started. But this is a poem uh, that came uh, much later. And uh, and initially I debated whether to put it in, and then I realized that part of what I enjoy is sort of putting in these childhood poems in every book that I write. So uh, this is a poem called The Cotton Ball Queen. The Cotton Ball Queen. In 1970, Havana, Cuba, my mother took it upon herself to inject B12 on the butt cheeks of as many neighbors as brought doses and paid for her services. My mother wanted to be a nurse, but was not a nurse. The house filled with women waiting for their shots. And I, age eight, watched them lower one side of their pants or shorts or pull up a dress to expose their flesh to the needle. My mother swabbed their skin with a cotton ball drenched in alcohol after each shot and threw it in a bucket by the kitchen door. When she was not looking, I reached for a handful and went outside to look at how the blood darkened. I wrapped my toy soldiers in the used cotton. They were wounded. Cuba was sending military personnel to Vietnam. My mother shot up more people, enfermos as she called them. When my father came home, there was no trace of anyone ever been over. My mother expected me to keep her secrets. On the mud fort I had built in the patio, all my soldiers lay wounded, bloodied and dying. At night, I dreamt of white pillowcases filling with bloody cotton balls. In the United States, my mother worked in a factory sewing zippers at 10 cents a piece, 25 years. She never looked up from her machine. Her fingers became arthritic. Every time I cut myself shaving, I reach for a cotton ball to soak up the blood. Blood is a red bird taking flight against the darkening of the sky. Yeah, and that was a cotton ball queen. From, yes. Yeah, from um, Virgil Suarez's newest book, American Chernobyl, which I uh, see the beautiful cover here. And I think, I assume the cover is your own photography too, right? Yes. Yeah. It, it's all my assets. It's called in the uh, Photoshop business. Uh, it's, it's all my assets. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, uh, go ahead. Yeah. It's a beautiful book because of the uh, artwork, especially, um, you know, I have to say, Thank you. Thank if you, you, if you look, I mean, even, I even love your author photo. Let me show your author photo for Thank just a you. second on the screen too. Um, it's right here. But I love this, uh, you with a cigar driving a tractor. <laughs> Actually, it's it's an abandoned city bus. Oh, is that what it is? Which is better, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is. That's very cool. Yeah. Um, but the whole book is just beautiful. Hardcover and this, I think it's a limited edition, uh, 100 copies, I think, or something like that. Something like that, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a small print. I mean, it's still available, but mm -hmm. I, I I did a, a 100 uh, um, 
copy, uh, you know, limited edition signed and uh, free art thrown <laughs> in, so to speak. So so tell us how, uh, how the book came to be. You mentioned that before. Uh, what was it that made you want to write this book? Well, you know, I had always wanted to do, I mean, I've, I've done art most of my life and I had been on the road taking photographs always uh, gravitating towards these landscapes that were constantly changing. Um, and since I ride a motorcycle, I normally stay on the blue highways. And, and that is just a technicality because I hate riding my bike above 55 miles an hour. So the only way you could do that is if you stay on the little, uh, on the little highways. Uh, and off of those highways, you find a lot of what I call road gold, uh, just, you know, abandoned motels, empty warehouses, uh, buildings from another time in a little downtown cross street section um, that are just beautiful and they're sitting there decaying. So that's that's what I shot most of the time. It wasn't until I went to Detroit uh, with a student of mine, a good friend of mine um, who who is from Detroit. He kept saying, you must see Detroit because it's sort of the epicenter of this thing that you love, you know, this kind of abandonment, right, in mass flight. Uh, so finally, during the pandemic, we went and visited, and uh, I was just uh, floored the the level and beauty of these buildings that are decaying uh, and that have been abandoned now for years, uh, neighborhoods where houses burn down and nothing ever goes back up. So, um and so I was I was doing the art, I was doing the the photography, and of course I had always been writing poetry. Uh, and so when the pandemic hit, uh, by this point I had also been taking um, quite a bit of um, uh, you know not only doing research but also uh, taking these online courses on how to do Photoshop and InDesign. And I figured I'm too old to waste time sending. Uh, a book of photographs slash paintings and poems to be vetted by a publisher uh, who would not know that I, you know, that I took photographs or that, you know, that they thought my work would be good. So I decided to bypass all of that and do the book myself in part because I was having so much fun with Photoshop and in design. Uh, also that I wanted to orchestrate some uh, sort of uh, personal essays in their very brief essays, introducing each of the sections as to why I take photographs, why I do the art, and even the uh, the poetry, which is, you know, uh, what has kept me going all these years. So the book came about that way. Uh, later on, as I think we left the 2016, 2020, uh, I started to really think about uh, the terrain, the American landscape, the, the political um, craziness that we had been subjected to. So I kept thinking of these horrifying things like the children who are still, by the way, being held at the border, uh, being separated from their parents and our inability to understand and remember on history and how we're doomed to repeat it. And so I started incorporating a lot of that. And eventually I named the book American Chernobyl because I thought this is kind of a a general sickness that, of course, the book deals with what happened at Chernobyl, but it also deals with the after effects of a world gone mad, right? A world where, um, you know, the, 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 last, the last thing we worry about is the planet. And I think we're taxing the planet to the level now uh like today i mean we we were uh we are in saint petersburg florida and we didn't have air conditioning and it was so hot and i kept thinking oh my god whatever happened you know what happens if we suddenly don't have electricity we can't run our air conditioning a lot of people would die you know as they are dying in places like texas uh you know, so I just I just thought I I put it all in there, orchestrate my own graphics, my own uh, layout, and I had quite a bit of fun. So I thought, you know what, I'll I'll print the book and I'll send it out with free art because that's part of what I do. I I create so much art that I end up sending it out for free because I don't. I've always thought, as with poetry, I don't want to have anything to do with money, you know, and that's that's a crazy thing to say because we all want to get paid, but uh, it's such slim pickings anyway. And, I, and I'm and i lucky enough to have a job as a professor. And so I get paid that way. 
So most of the time when I create something, I like to give it away. And that's sort of the human exchange, um, you know. So that's that's basically uh, in a nutshell what how the book came about. And, the, and COVID helped because mm-hmm. we were all home. And so it, um, it 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 allowed me to really focus. So yeah. Yeah. Well, as we're talking, I was showing uh, photos on the screen for those watching. Uh, you know, the, the just beautiful photography in it. Uh, you know, that beautiful urban decay type photography, mm-hmm. which beautiful is a strange way to put it, but it is at the same time, right? Yeah. No, it's also. I mean, there's there's a, a kind of melancholia. There's um, you know all of these beautiful like Italian, you know, chiaroscuro and penumbra and all of this stuff that that when you enter these buildings, you you know the moats floating in the rays of light. I mean, it's very poetic, but at the same time, it's overwhelming um, and and really emotional because you know that this is a place where uh, people have come and gone, people have lived died uh, where they're they've you know lived their lives and all of a sudden now it's abandoned um my interest also in looking at urban uh you know exploring urban uh, landscapes has to do with the fact that uh over time we've sort of have forgotten you know the utility of these buildings and so we have no qualms about abandoning them abandoning them um and so I always think, well, we discard these beautiful things. Like there is a uh, an old church in Detroit that these kids bought, and they've turned it. And I, and I think it's part of a documentary you can watch. I don't know. You'd have to punch in uh, Detroit church and then uh, skating. Uh, but these boys bought the church, and they turned it into a roller skating, uh, like a skateboarding type of uh, place with ramps. And it's an amazing, um, you know, combination of a beautiful old church and the need for these kids to be able to skateboard uh, without getting harassed. Uh, and so it's uh, it's something beautiful that uh, is is there. And so to be able to see it and photograph it, um, it's it's always an honor. I think before they go, before they get erased, and then nobody will know. And part of my fascination is. Uh, the masonry work, uh, what happens when one day comes and we no longer know how to do that kind of work, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's getting there already. So Detroit is the epicenter of these amazing old buildings from the turn of the century who are, which are disappearing because nobody has any use for them. It's very sad as opposed to what is going on in suburbia, Mm -hmm. which is these, um, you know, eco-friendly uh, kind of throwaway uh, buildings that'll be part of a, uh, you know, uh, mall at the corner, right? Uh, we don't we don't have that kind of grandeur anymore about our architecture. So it's you know, it yeah. was something it was something to do too. You know. Yeah. Well, I think a lot about that uh, driving from Los Angeles to, to Las Vegas, which I do you know, relatively often. And, you know, there's those huge seas of houses packed on top of each other, much bigger than anybody needs a house. And then you keep driving and there's in the desert, there's just all these abandoned, you know, buildings that just just the cinder block is left and, you know, graffiti ever. There's a water slide park that's just completely abandoned out there, too. And you just think of how time moves on and, and we just let things go. And, and the, you know, so documenting some of this stuff is really fascinating as you read through the book. Do you want to read another poem before we, uh, sure. we talk too much? Yeah. Sure. I think we have the sin eaters next. Uh, the yes, the sin the sin eaters, and of course it's got the Russian, uh, which I could not begin to pronounce. So, uh, the sin eaters, it takes the rogue Adam, to finally speak of squalid conditions in cages, screams in the middle of the night, children crying for their ghost mothers. You don't know what cracks open in the dark, for it takes one Adam to yearn for another, a collision so bright it blinds the first responders, the firefighters called to the scene who rush in and feel their skin singe, their tongues parch with the poison of a new age. They do their job, they die horrible, excruciating deaths. Later, now the earth rattles under their feet Mother speaks about eating sins, about the man who swallows truths so that others don't go blind. Poets are used to gouging out their eyes, carry the weight of their hundred breasts. For now, the men rush in to douse the flames that will burn for weeks, months, 
particles inundate the air, blanket the multitudes in Europe, a slow trickle, one breath at a time. Nobody knows what the sin eaters would much rather eat, but they swallow what my father would have called retama de Guayacol, the lowest of the low. And that was the sin eaters, again, from, uh, yes, sir. from Virgil Suarez's book, uh, American Chernobyl, uh, which you can get on Amazon. Um, so, so Virgil, you mentioned uh, the decay being a, a kind of sickness. Uh, what do you think the root of that is? Like, like, what do you think is going on? Why are we in this sort of era of decline? I don't, well, that's part of what fascinates me. I don't know if it's some sort of social experiment gone awry, uh, this whole idea that, uh, and again, I think for me in my mind, it has a genesis, and that genesis is that we're living in a country where uh, people are not really meant to get along at all because it's you know you can think about all of the bloody history you want but the idea that there's always been a demand for separation and so the the experiment is to see how you can railroad people into better um living conditions right better schools i'm always amazed how people get confused about what is going on in the south with the republican agenda which is as clear as water which is that once schools were mandated to be desegregated, you know, they, everybody went nuts, right? P people wanted to have access to schools where they can send their kids, right? So over time, the under the table agenda has been, we are going to do our best to destroy the fabric of what was once done and, and with very good intention and very good ideas, we're going to destroy it and we'll show you a thing or two, right? Like in the South, this business of, you know, the war of Northern aggression, that's usually a, a sign that it's a lot of people haven't gotten over it. Um, and to me, looking at the landscape, uh, people like here in Florida, my God, uh, Florida is the, uh, is sort of the poster child of gated communities where people come to live with the same kind, right? And they don't want to be they, they don't want to be exposed to anybody else. So they live in these gated communities. They toil the land. They break up the land to build these uh, cheap, uh, most of the time extremely ugly. Uh, structures, uh, which is fine for them, you know, the Walmart, the Home Depot, and so they have abandoned their old lives in in these downtowns, right? Um, like we live near uh, Georgia, so I'm always in and out of Thomasville, and I photographed a lot of Thomasville, the downtown, because they really take pride in their downtown, as do a lot of little towns in Georgia. As opposed to as opposed to Florida, which is uh, never mind the old. Let's build the new and let's attract these uh, people um, who are you know for whatever political reasons are going to come down, vote Republican, blah blah blah. But they have um, basically obliterated uh, the landscape, and they don't care. It's just like a washing machine; you just throw it out when it's no longer useful. You throw it out, um, and so. I, you know, certainly in Florida, you feel it. I think in certain parts of Texas, you also see it in L.A., certainly. Uh, but these places that spring up in the middle, literally of nowhere. And now it's what people want. Right. Uh, this is happening a lot around universities. I'm sure you've seen it uh, where, you know, they'll build these centers for young people to go and and kind of shop and and uh, enjoy their lives but everything is new as if to say the new generations want brand spanking new stuff god forbid they walk into an old building uh, that's made out of bricks you know um so it's a, it's a kind of coagulation towards these places uh on purpose on purpose i think you know and so the inner cities are left to the folks who can you know who will fend for themselves i remember la i mean i grew up in la from 74 until about 84 and uh, you had these old you know standard neighborhoods um that people were not necessarily railroaded there, but, uh, the, you know, you had the Mexican neighborhoods, you had the African-American neighborhoods, you had the Asian neighborhoods, and everybody localized there, you know, as opposed to a lot of white people who then 
you know, I mean, when I think of the term white flight, uh, that was certainly the case in LA and places like Glendale and Linwood, uh, where you had these workers that had come to do uh, Firestone and Goodyear and a lot of uh, aero uh, engineering. And eventually they left because the cities were becoming much more brown and black. Um, and those neighborhoods 30 years later, 40 years later have, have changed. So uh, it, it's kind of a fascination with the way that we have uh, conducted these social experiments in terms of how what we think people want to live in. Like who in their right mind would live in a, on a zero lot property mm -hmm. uh, in, in these beehives and Florida's full of them. Uh, where you are on top of your neighbor, as opposed to maybe, maybe I don't know, maybe in 2024 now, land is at a premium and nobody can afford acreage, right? Or maybe just a lot. Uh, but I think these places are engineered to attract people. They they tell you, uh, come and buy this 4,000 square foot home for $287,000 and people flock to it the only problem is you're not told there's nothing there. There's no history there. It's just dirt that has been turned into, I guess, a good deal. Or at least they interpret it that way. Yeah, it was to very, me, yeah, when I moved to California, it was very surprising to me just that looking around and, and realizing nothing was old. You know, so little is old out here, yeah. whereas I grew up in uh, western New York in Rochester, and there's so much stuff. I mean, the, the, the peak of the city was 100 years ago when all the, you know, industry was, was there. And, um, you know, and, and so coming to a place where everything is just new yeah. um, feels like there's no sense of connection with the past, which must affect the way you yeah. think, too. I also think about, you know, that's sort of the ultimate of consumerism, uh, you know, that kind of culture, which, which tr you know, teaches planned obsolescence. So we have to keep buying yeah. new things. And if you make things that are that are crap, then you're forced to keep buying them. And so it's sort of a, I mean, an external projection of that. Uh, but but I want to make sure. Yeah, well, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, that in my time, I mean, the connection for me between a place like Detroit and L.A., it was that in L.A. you had a beautiful rail uh, streetcar system. And then these uh, guys from Detroit showed up and started working deals with the, uh, w you know, with the politicians said, let's turn L.A. into a uh, a city where ever been on. And, well, and there's only two lines. It goes, <laughs> yeah, and, <laughs> it's like and an don't X. Intend to be on there. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you have to imagine L.A. back in the 20s and 30s with this beautiful streetcar. And so you begin to realize that there is a mandate by the few to kind of dictate how the masses are going to live and how and 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 the thing about LA if i remember correctly was that as people uh got stuck in traffic more and more they basically in order to afford a better you know better living uh, uh conditions they would move an hour two hours away and then they would have to commute to work and i think a lot of that is still around oh it I mean, definitely is the, yeah yeah yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, an hour and a half away uh, on yeah. a good day <laughs> and, you know, three right. on a bad day. And I know right. people commute into into Los Angeles from from yeah. our small town. So, yeah, it, it's definitely and then, you know, the, and then that pushes yeah. everything farther and makes the roads even more congested because even more people have to yeah. drive even more distance. And, uh, yeah, it's it's definitely uh, not the it's not a fourth site kind of uh, setup that we've got no. going on in no. Southern California, no. at least. But I want to make sure we, we cover a lot of poems because uh, oh, people okay. are always saying more right. poems, more poems. Let's more do poems. the body farm. And, and there's a photo that kind of it's on the facing page. I'll show this before we read the poem. Right. Um, but this is another one. from. I think you might have seen a, a bigger picture where this is almost a detail from a different angle. But here is uh, the poem that's facing the or the, the image that's yeah. facing the body farm. And here's the body farm. The body farm. My youngest tells me about the body farm experience where you walk with your human anatomy class through a few isolated acres of corpses arranged in different scenarios and left to decompose inside cars blooming under a tree laid down in a ravine all putrefying nature taking its sweet time birds plucking hairs with which to line nests flies laying eggs the ants who make quick work of whatever salt resides in the lacrimal glands buzzards gather rather funereal and gaunt no shadows here just students with perfume plugs in their nostrils i can smell it even through the phone what is the difference in death 
One day you blow out a candle, the next you're no better than mulch. My mother-in-law called it a light bulb dimming. That's the signal. And I see a man rush into the centrifugal force of atoms colliding at Chernobyl reactors, his skin blushes with the tincture of poison blood. Listen, that smell right now? Yes, it's your own body sending the message. Last night's cabbage and boiled boudin relish the perfume of the living. <laughs> yeah, and that was The Body Farm. Uh, a very vivid poem from uh, American Chernobyl. Yeah, that was uh, another book poem by Virgil Suarez. And uh, so, can you tell us about how you got into poetry? Um, how, how, you know, what was it you, uh, you know, you came from, from Cuba when you were 12. Was it, when did you start writing and, and why? Well, that story in itself is kind of a horrifying thing. And I'll, I'll be very brief, but it tells you a little bit about what was going on in California in 1970. By 1974, um, I arrived uh, and I, re I distinctly remember going to my first uh, round of classes. Uh, my mother had basically dressed me in a three-piece uh, denim suit, if you can imagine that. Um, and so my very first official class in the seventh grade was physical education, which I knew nothing about because prior to that, I had never done any kind of physical education. Um, and I didn't speak a word of English. So I found myself being pulled into this locker room and then be made to strip naked and then be made to shower. And I had no idea. So I, I always thought, I uh, I always think of, um, oh my God, you can probably refresh my memory. Uh, the death of the ball turret gunner. Who, who wrote that? Uh, Randall Gerald. Yeah, I always, I love that image of being host out of the uh, of the ball turret because I, I felt like that I was put in mm. the seventh grade and kind of birthed into this experience of going naked into the world showering with 300 anyways I was it was it was terrible anyway what that did was it made me recoil from being out in the open in in school and I sort of uh, sought refuge in a teacher's classrooms. And I remember my seventh grade English teacher was uh, of Miss Sensi, who uh, then got me to read Romeo and Juliet. And later on, uh, Mr. Branscombe, where uh, he introduced me to Edgar Allan Poe, who had a huge effect on me. Then in the 10th grade, 11th grade, I had Mr. Alvarado, who started introducing me to some of the Spanish uh, poets like Neruda, uh, people like that, right? And um, so I, I started writing it, uh, even though uh, I was still thinking that I was going to get um, a degree in in art because I wanted to animate for Walt Disney. And I tried my best to get there. But once we, and by we, I mean the, the people looking at me and myself, realized that I could not do life drawings quick enough. I didn't have the gift to be an animator. So I, I I ended up going to Cal State Long Beach to do illustration. That first semester I was uh, in the program, I realized it could never be as good as my classmates. And so I ran for dear life. I thought I would become a, um, a journalist. And looking for one more class that I needed, I ran into Elliot Freed at Long Beach who said, hey, uh, if you're looking for a class, I'm teaching this novel writing workshop, uh, and I expect a lot from the student. It's going to be a two-semester class, and I enrolled in it and wrote my first novel, uh, second novel published. Uh, so I, once I got going, it was poetry and fiction uh, for, for the duration. These days, I'll, I think for the last 25 years or so, I have done poetry, uh, and I can talk endlessly about why that is but i love poetry for for its purity for the for the fact that there aren't that many handlers uh involved in the world of poetry i don't need an agent i don't have to worry about how hollywood is going to mangle my poems if they're ever made into a movie i i, I don't have any of those worries whereas as a, as a fiction writer i always thought of not only money but the idea that i'd be you know 
uh, I think the way that a lot of people think about it, uh, not that I would be a household word, but that I would be able to make a living off of my art. And that's as far from the truth as is humanly possible. So, yeah, I'm well, like, we definitely know yeah. that. Uh, yeah. And, and so the, in the chat, a lot of people are uh, were asking about that, the body farm and the actual, and I assume it's forensics, you know, for pathologists yeah. to study. Yeah. So if in yeah. case, you know, for when they find bodies in the in the woods and, and that's something that actually exists. You didn't make it up. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, I, I did not make yeah. it up. The first time I heard about it uh, was an NPR. And then my daughter, who, who uh, ended up becoming a chemist, but at one time she was interested in um, in, in medicine, she, she took a tour to the one in uh, Florida. I did not know uh, that there was a second body farm, but apparently these things are springing up. Wow. Uh, no pun intended everywhere. Yeah. Uh, and I was amazed because the heat... I mean, every the whole process in Florida has to be so much faster. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, people, you need permission uh, to to go in there, obviously. And then once you're in there, I think for the most part, you're on your own. Whatever you see is going to affect you. And oh, wow. uh, so people people go in groups for that reason. I think. You well, know? definitely the kind of thing that that inspires a poem for sure. I mean, poem written yeah. about that is uh, so graphic and and fascinating and strange. Yeah. Um, and, and almost surreal. How does, what is your process like? So you heard about that story and then you heard, you knew somebody who, who yeah. had, had visited one. So how long until that becomes a poem? How long does it percolate? The, it, it percolates for a while sometimes, or if it's something that just grabs me in the, in the moment. And I think this poem came fairly fast for that reason. I already knew about the body farm, but what brought it, what brought it back uh, was my daughter saying, oh, I just, I went there and I go, oh my God, I can't believe you. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, at once I'm jealous, uh, but at the same token, I, by the same token, I think, oh my God, she's just so young and to be exposed. I mean, I'm not sure I would go to such a place, but it, it's the kind of prompt that I think about. And then eventually the words start piling up and the images, um, I remember one of the images that I kept working was the ants in the eyes. And I kept thinking, well, yeah, but what about the eyes? What about the eyes? And I thought, what if they are attracted to some sort of saline and the lacrimal glands, right? So I thought, okay, lacrimal glands, I've never you know, heard of this. So I, I, I it, it, you know, it's words in combination that end up exciting me and I, and I have to use it, you know? Um, so yeah, that's, that's how most of the poems come. Um, but it's a matter of layering in and layering in until I get it, until I get it just right. And some poems, I thought the poem was a little bit, uh, kind of down and out. So the idea, the realization, and this was partly, uh, true to life, right? I'm sitting here writing a poem about human decay and I've had, I don't know, cabbage and some sort of beef. And so, you, you know, you burp or you fart and you smell and, and then you realize, oh, it's the body letting me know that it's it's kind of still alive and that's a good thing right yeah well definitely it's better than the alternative <laughs> yeah it's uh, yeah compared to the alternative horrible yeah uh, well it so, feels so to me that. yeah it feels to me like your poems spring out of music a lot some people have already mentioned how musical yeah. it is hearing the poems and there's a sense of rhythm it feels like you're one yeah. of the poets that the rhythm draws you through the poem so so how much does that come in the first draft and how much comes in the revision process I uh, I think, and, and th I've done this most of my life, I tend to write with music on, or I, I tend to write, you know, to compose with music on. Uh, and during the pandemic and beyond, I rediscovered, um, uh, what is it, um, Sun Ra Orchestra. Uh, somebody that initially, when I was younger, I listened to and they go, this guy is not well, right? But later, uh, you know, I've discovered the fact that I can, I can go on and on and on, and it does wonders for my ability to connect words. So maybe some of that uh, triggers in, right? I've always been horrible at iambics, at meter, uh, at rhyme. Uh, so I've I've stayed away from it. And I, like I tell my students, my number one horror story, uh, thinking about the job market and all of that, is that I go to a to a uh, to an interview for a job and I do great. And as I'm walking away at the last minute from the board, somebody in the audience says, wait a minute, not yet. 
I need you to scan these five lines from Shakespeare and put the accent marks. And then I wake up in a sweat because I think, oh, my God, I, I don't know how to do any of that. So I do depend on the also repetition of reading it aloud, mm -hmm. reading the stuff to myself. Sometimes I record I record the poem and then I listen back and, you know, it, and it helps. Uh, but I don't go seeking the musicality. I think it just it naturally either because I'm listening to music while I'm composing or because I do love sort of the sing song, sing song in nature of English mm -hmm. um, that uh, it kind of comes natural, you know. Yeah. But if you ask me to scan a poem, <laughs> my, my own or somebody else's. I cannot do it. Well, it's funny you so. mention uh, that kind of dream because I had a dream last night. <laughs> I okay. got the, the next issue of Rattle came and uh, every like third page was black and like gray and kind of mushy. <laughs> and I skipped in like three in it like too small to read. And I was like, oh, no. And, you know, there's I don't know. So that, I guess that's the difference between the yes. editor and the writer's desk. But um yeah. Um, well, if anybody has any questions for Virgil, uh, please leave them in the chat windows, either on Facebook or YouTube. But let's hear another poem. Uh, All right. Virgil. What, uh, yeah. keep, you're keeping me uh, going here. Yeah, we're, we're trying to mix what, the talk and the poem. Here we go. Um, it's coming. It's coming. The next poem. It's a graphite? Oh, idea? actually, yeah. The next poem. Um, last year was very tough uh, for me because... Uh, Certainly a little bit before the pandemic, but certainly during the pandemic, I began, became very good, close friends with Michael Rothenberg, uh, who was a kindred spirit, who brought a lot of energy to our conversations. Um, and then and then he passed away last year. And so we, we miss him greatly. And this poem I ended up dedicating to him. This is called Graphite for Michael Rothenberg. In school, we use the standard number two pencil sharpened into a needle tip, or we scratched it on sandpaper to smudge our art into submission. But graphite in the hands of progress transforms into a sign of impending destruction, like Hansel and Gretel's breadcrumbs trailed behind to find our way back. But there is no return once the coil bursts and a nuclear reactor, graphite moderators of neutrons, fission, friction, water, steam, what fuck else can go wrong, dust, and pop goes the weasel, or rather boom, then fire, then poisoned air, waiting, wafting over the landscape, turning matter into mush, mush back into dark water, upon which, if you catch your reflection, you see a boy drawing a self-portrait on the whitest paper, so white, in fact, that most go blind. Yeah, and that was graphite uh, from, uh, again, from American Chernobyl, another poem that, that references back to Chernobyl. Somebody had asked what the Russian was on that, in that previous poem, and, and that's- it, the... it's, it's actually the Sin Eaters. That's, that's Sin Eaters in Russian. Um, according to Google Translator, of course, <laughs> because I don't speak Russian, uh, which was very difficult when I was setting the book. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to use a lot more Russian, but uh, for some reason, I found it really hard to find the the uh, the, uh, the typeface that would translate into Russian. So I figured, let me keep it to a minimum. Yeah, you know? definitely, it's difficult. Uh, that's something yeah. we've done, you know, in a few issues of Rattle, different yeah. different yeah. you know languages that don't use the. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, the alphabet that we have and it's difficult sometimes um, yeah. so it's a good segue into into the self-publishing of this book um, and so you mentioned you know typesetting it yourself and, and going through all that trouble someone else wanted to know if where it's available is it just Amazon that's the link that it's, I found it's just Amazon yeah it's because Amazon. you used, you used create space I imagine right to, yeah, to publish it I create and Kindle um, and now the the problems that I had with Amazon had a lot more to do with um, uploading the, the, the 18, you know, I want to say 1800 times, but it was close to 18 times mm -hmm. that I had to reformat the book and upload it. I was not in a hurry, but I had a timeline more or less. I, I wanted to release the book not too far from the end of the pandemic, where, where in, whether in fact we have, we are at the end of the pandemic, nobody knows. Um, but I wanted to release it. I wanted to do it myself. I wanted to put a lot of 
uh, of myself, not only the photographs and the art, but also the poetry. I, I wanted to have a conversation. And I had always wanted to do a coffee table top type of book. So when I went looking for the formats on Amazon, uh, this format popped up and I thought, oh, great. Now the problem was how do I make uh, the art and the photographs were very easy to set on the page. The poems were a little bit much more difficult because suddenly you have a lot more space. Mm -hmm. So you have to ponder, do I put do I break the, the poems up into columns and and put you know and put three columns on a page? How do I do it? So I always thought about simplicity and just making it reader friendly. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to do, and that's why I like the larger format, is my eyesight is going very quickly. So I wanted to be reader friendly to all sorts of people who are either myopic or uh, have issues reading. So I wanted to do larger text. And I wanted for the uh, for, for the work itself, both with art and photography, to stand out in that way. So I I opted for the large format. The standard for poetry volumes is six by nine, mm -hmm. which I think is perfect, and that's why there are so many poetry volumes that are the standard six by nine because it's perfect. But then it doesn't allow you to play around too much with graphics. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and when it came time for the graphics, I also started to think that I wanted to put the kind of graphics that would delight me as a, as a reader. I wanted to put little punctuation marks along the way. I wanted I wanted to uh, put the numbers inside of a circle, little things like mm -hmm. that. That as a, as a reader of books, I've always noted. I've always looked at design. Right, uh, Chip Kid is my you know design god. I I love his work, and everybody knows who Chip Kid is. Uh, working out of mostly uh, New York. Uh, Knopf, that's you mm -hmm. know, and he just he he's so particular with his details, and he makes you know those covers. But basically, the books sell because it's a chip kid design. Mm -hmm. Not to take credit away from the actual novel, right, or the text, but I wanted to do a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm comparing myself to Chip Kid <laughs> because I'm not, but I wanted to play around with topography. I wanted to design the page. Uh, and I spent a lot of time. I would, and it wasn't wasted time learning both Photoshop, Lightroom, and um, and InDesign to be able to do that. So I figured the the pandemic is the perfect time. Uh, I'm not going to be spending any time querying publishers. Uh, the poems and the artwork I did send out to particular magazines that I liked, and so the the poems and the and the uh, pictures. And um, art got published here and there, and th that you can find on the acknowledgments page. Uh, and they were fairly well received, but I mm -hmm. know for a fact that a mainstream publisher would basically said, okay, we know that you're a poet, uh, a, a working poet, uh, but we don't know where these photographs and this art is coming from. Mm -hmm. You haven't been vetted. Uh, and I totally respect that but being 61 going on to 70 here pretty soon i felt that i didn't want to waste any time and mm -hmm. i thought you know this is the time uh to do the book myself and i had already been doing little chat books for people and mm -hmm. stuff and and i thought why not and yeah. plus i don't have any of the hang-ups uh that you hear about in, in you know academic circles and i understand why that's there the peer review process and all of that uh but technology is such that if you're an artist in this day and age you don't need permission from anybody mm -hmm. you could do your art you could do your music and and move it along you know let yeah. people find it yeah well you kind of answered the question i had but but you know that your last book was with was pit press which is literally my favorite press so yeah. you know i mean they, they published just the best books and uh, and so, you know, the idea you could have easily published this book was on the press. So I was wondering why you didn't. But it's the, well, the weight it, and my, the well, difficulty with the, what you wanted to do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, my editor at UPIT, uh, who ran the series for many years, was Ed O'Chester. And I, I many times I as, as tempted as I was, I would put myself in Ed's shoes and I would hear his voice saying, uh, I like the poems, but what what the hell are these pictures and uh, <laughs> and art doing in this book, right? And I didn't want to put myself into that mm -hmm. uh, situation because I knew that it was going to happen. Eventually, somebody was going to say, who the hell do you think you are uh, with these photographs and this art, you know? 
Uh, and at that point, also Ed Ochester was retiring, and he now I think Terrence Hayes and um, who else? Uh, oh my God! Now I'm I'm not uh, uh, Terrence Hayes and oh, uh, what's the name of the other co-editor? Uh, I don't know right now. Um, there, well, there's going to be two editors mm -hmm. editing the uh, UPID series. Um, and uh, so we'll see, you know, I don't, I haven't gotten any instructions in terms of what we do to submit a book uh, because now we're looking, I, I remember when uh, Dave Smith and Andre Kondreski started editing the Southern Review and there was very little communication between the two of them, which I hope is not the case here, but it might easily be, um, you know, oh, Jeffrey McDaniel. Uh, that's oh, okay. that's the other uh -huh. one. Yeah, g great, great, great poets, wonderful uh, human beings. But again, I don't know uh, what the process is going to be because uh, most of us would just send, when the book was ready, we would send it to Ed. Ed would, uh, I guess, uh, send it out to a couple of other people. I don't know. And then we would get the good news. It's like, hey, your book is... <laughs> Uh, coming out. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm okay with it because I've always published, uh, except for Pittsburgh, I've always published with new presses all of the time. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm used to that. Uh, and I'm not afraid of it. It's almost like having, uh, not that I say that's a good thing uh, to be housed in the same press for, for the rest of your days. But I like, I like the pat on the back. I like the fact that given different circumstances, people react to the work uh, positively and then new presses are going to publish you, you know? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, I want to talk more about that, but let's, uh, I want to make sure we get enough poems into. So let's do yes, uh, more poem. a love like song more, for my hematologist yeah, is up next. More cowbell, more, more poetry. <laughs> more cowbell, yeah. Um, Actually, I, I wanted to read this poem to my actual hematologist, but he, he left. <laughs> so, uh, a love song from my hematologist. As he daintily places the stethoscope on my skin, first the heart, my left bundle branch blocked heart, where no electricity has seen the light of day. His breath is fig marmalade sweet, his eyes show where love hurt him bad. There's great sadness in the way he holds the metal under my double D man breast. He is lost to the rhythms of my soon to be defibrillated heart. He tells me I will not die from this, but that I should try and get more exercise, go out for short walks, stand often and flex my body so that my legs won't atrophy. I love this man like I have loved all of my doctors, male or female. They know I am not human. They can feel it, but don't say it. And I appreciate the confidence by which they pretend that I am already dead in their hands, a familiar ghost they've come to depend on, as if I often ravage their ears with my own stories of excess or how the first responders at Chernobyl rushed in with all their power only to become fireflies in the night, flashing their nuptial invitations in the dark of fields. The human body feels terror first in the hair follicles, or at least that's what I feel when I look in the mirror and catch glimpses of my 60-year-old self. How we got here, I do not know, but I can tell you it's been a wild ride, first in the dirt of Havana, then later in the cold of Madrid, and now in the humidity of North Florida, where the birds are falling dead from the skies. I can tell he is done. He tells me I won't be dying today, and I kiss him on his lips. That's great. Love that ending. That was a Thank love you. song from my hematologist, again, from American Chernobyl. And uh, if you don't mind, can we talk about the the economics of using create space. Cause the first thing I think of, you know, you mentioned what Ed Ochester yeah. might think of with the pictures, but I think of how much the, a book like this would cost to make as a publisher, you know, because the cover, the, the color, every color signature adds about 50% to the cost of the ink and then the hardcover and the, and the over large size. Um, it, it, it's pretty expensive to make for a book, which, you know, if I was running a, uh, you know, U pit, I would, I would question that just for that. And I'd say like, you know, if you want to, shell out some money <laughs> to, right, to pay right. for it. I'd publish a book right. like that. But, uh, you know, not, not my own dime because it's just a lot to put up 
uh, you know, up front for, for a high quality book like that. So how was it like on, how, how does that work on CreateSpace? Once I started to research the, uh, the different formats and, you know, you, you, you do get a kind of a schedule of depending on the format and how many pages, right. And whether it's hardcover or trade paper, um, CreateSpace gives you a breakdown or KDP actually, because it's no longer CreateSpace's Kindle Direct Publishing. Uh, they'll tell you exactly how much the book has to sell for in order for you to, you know, also depending on the breakdown. And I'm going to be completely transparent here. Uh, this book was actually meant to be priced at $20.99 because I didn't really want to make any royalties on it. But because um, because of some flaws of the early designs, for some reason, the cover went through and it, and it stuck. And so every time I tried to upload the body, it wouldn't let me do it. And at that point, I had started uh, with $24.99, which is where it stuck. Um, for example, I buy copies at a minimum, I, th- I want to say $12.99 per copy. They KDP sells me mm-hmm. copies at that price. And then when they sell it and the, they distribute it, the price of $24.95, they keep the majority of that. And I think I end up making $4 per mm-hmm. copy of the book, which is, it's not bad. But you know, what I like about it is the fact that I don't have to keep overstock in my garage exactly, getting ruined. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fact that I can mail copies to people directly through Amazon, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, and and the beauty of it is that I can either pay the $24.99 myself or I can buy copies at $12.99 or whatever it is that they sell it to me and then distribute that way. So it's a little easy, but over time, um, in particular, once you start looking at distribution in other Amazon territories, the, eventually the sort of the um, the royalties begin to disappear and Amazon ends up keeping mm-hmm. uh, mo- most of the money, which again, as, a, as an exercise, as an experiment, I'm OK with it, mm-hmm. uh, you know. The other reason why I went with them and not with somebody like Blurb, with whom I had published a lot of chat books before, um, uh, basically had to do with the fact that Amazon KDP has really upped their production value, not only on paper, but on graphics, you know. Um, so everything lined up and I figured I don't want to ha- have any hassles. I just want to upload my book and not really have it taking up space mm-hmm. in my garage or on my shelves, right? Um, and the fact that it'll be around for however long um, Amazon is around, people will have access to it, which is similar to what a lot of publishers are doing anyway. Mm-hmm. But I just, again, I just wanted, the impetus for this was I wanted to do the book my way and I didn't want to spend any time querying around for a publisher. I mean, if I were Francis Bacon, uh, you know, Tashin would be doing my book, right? Of course, I would be dead, but you know, Tashin or some of these amazing book publishers. But I'm not Francis Bacon, so and I'm 61. I need to get, you know, move it along, move it along, little doggy. So I, I decided to take matters into my, and I'm, I'm very pleased with mm-hmm. the way. And at the end of the day, also that, you know, again, like I tell my students, you know, check your expectations at the door. Uh, I know for a fact that as much poetry as I have published in the last 30 years, I have maybe a total of 150 to maybe if I'm lucky, 300 devoted readers. So a limited edition was perfect. And the fact that I had enough art to be able to send Mm -hmm. a a free art sample with the book, sign, number, that kind of thing. So I I really enjoyed that, you know, I like that. Do you have any, you know, I've always felt uh, that it's just so convenient on on that Amazon platform. I mean, so I've been tempted to publish books myself there. Uh, The only downside is having to work with Amazon. Do you feel any, the conflict there of uh, Bezos, you know, like we mentioned in the first poem today? Well, yeah, Uh, there are a lot of conflicts there, but to be quite honest and and kind of, I'm glad I didn't deal with anybody at mm-hmm. Amazon. Yeah, I mean, I mean the, you, yeah. Fe- you feel very much like you're dealing with a computer, which in this day and age, it's fine with me. I didn't talk to anybody. Mm-hmm. I I form I designed and formatted my book 
I I got the format from Amazon, the specs, and I uploaded the book and off it went. I mean, they do claim that they have actually people looking over your book. Mm -hmm. I'm not convinced because the book <laughs> does have a few little uh, uh, ticks that I still need to fix. But yeah, it mm -hmm. was it was kind of an automatic flow. And I kind of like that because it, all of it came together for me and I figured yeah, well, I, if I don't have to deal with another human being and just upload them, that, that was perfect. Yeah, and there are a lot that of was, benefits to having it print on demand yeah. too. You know, so you don't have the big warehouse. Yeah. Even Amazon, you know, they they you know have a few books printed and then you know print more as they need them. There was a the bookstore we used to have our reading at. I loved it because they had it was yeah. just a, a local independent bookstore outside of Los Angeles. They had a print on demand machine, so you could like yeah. pull up the books you wanted from a menu and watch them be printed in front of you, and yeah. you know, just the you know because you know i mean people who don't know the publishing industry might not know but there's so yeah. many books are just remaindered you know that they're just yeah. pulped you know, that they're made they're they're put in a warehouse and then eventually they're just pulped up and made more paper with you uh, know a whole lot of energy and stuff in the process and so being able to just not have a inventory yeah. is a great benefit yeah. for well, one thing. I, i've i've been telling people and i got we all know writers with remainder books that are are not available anymore you know it might take you a while to type up the book again find the format and then just upload it. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you can use the book or maybe there's a way of scanning the book so that you can upload a facsimile of it mm -hmm. and have it printed so that the book is always available. Nothing sadder than the book that's out of print and that's no longer, I mean, I remember uh, back in the day when William Burroughs was still alive, I think they published the Western Lands and that thing immediately went and remaindered. And I would buy sets of it because it was 99 cents a copy to bring to my classes. Oh, yeah. And I felt, I mean, every writer, writer looks at that and says something went wrong in the process. Um, and there's nothing sadder than not having the book available. I, I'd much rather give my work away for free and have it be available than for a publisher to pay me a lot of money and 10 years later, nobody knows, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then eventually you disappear from the landscape, which is another th reason why I write poetry a lot more these days. And fiction, unless you stay on it and you have maybe better luck, uh, you know, it takes a long time. Mm -hmm. um, to, yeah. To... And with fiction, you know, so much is about the, the money, you know, for publishers and fiction yeah. because there is money. And then yeah. the, the fact is one author on any press is the one who pays for everybody else who yeah. they're, they're sort of scouting for maybe the next great author that'll pay for more author scouting. And that's, that's the model yeah. of um, yeah. the publishing novels and, and nonfiction. Yeah. Um, let, let's uh, do two more poems. So let's do the second to last poem. Right. Then we'll talk a little. Uh, Dig West ever wants us to talk about poetry more. And I think we should, too. So um, let's do one more poem, then we'll talk about uh, how you go about writing a poem a little bit, and then we'll do uh, the last poem. All right. Let us... Uh, oh, uh, horse meat, Bernal Equinox. Are we on the same page there? Yep, yep. Sounds good. I just have to pull it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see what, if it sounds good. Um, horse meat, Bernal Equinox. My father butchered horses to feed the tigers and lions at the Havana Zoo. I saw his cuticles pinked by residue. At night, the dry air popped my nasal capillaries. Cabecitas de vena, my mother called them. The trickle of constant blood flowed down my throat. A cotton ball stopped the blood from staining my pajamas or pillow. When the flow stopped, I pulled the cotton slow and a tendril of coagulated blood oozed from my nose and I kept it on the nightstand. In the morning, the dried up curlicue of blood looked dark and crispy, like what I imagined horse entrails looked like. Horses with ticks gorging in their ears, mosquitoes and flies tormenting my father and the other butchers. Yes, we ate horse meat, which my mother made into tasajo and served over boniato blanco. We ate what my father bought, brought home. At sunset, we watched the sky blush with orange, yellow orange. The cigar smoke wafted in the humid air. The frogs jumped in the cool port tiles, green spots by the windows. The crickets and fireflies buzzed in the grass. Sometimes the only place to be is right where you feel the weight of sleep taking you down a river darkening in the light. 
And that was horse meat vernal equinox. And then we have another another facing photo I'll show while we have this uh, page open. Oh, another yeah, one of those that's... beautiful urban decay photos of uh, what might be a grain silo or some kind of. It, I, I don't know. Yeah. It's in Georgia. It's in Thomasville, Georgia. And I've been going to photograph it every year for the last 18 mm. years. Uh, and every time I go, I'm delighted that it's still there. Because, again, you look at something like that and you it, it's a nice historical um walk back right like what is this what was it used for uh right why is it still here mm -hmm. and um but um yeah it was one of the it's one of the places that's sort of a sanctuary for me and i'm glad it's still there yeah yeah it's just so interesting to have a connection to the past through time like that you know the, the past doesn't go anywhere it just sits here changing <laughs> and uh, it's, it's yeah. interesting to connect to that and it's a really beautiful book to flip through for that reason um, the, the question Dick Westheimer asks, he says, can you talk about the poetics of these, the voice that moves all over the place, homing in on an ending? And, and the voice does seem to be key in your poetry. So how do you come to that voice and, and what do you think of as, as the voice of a poem? I think, I think it's the voice that I've developed all, all along, uh, my speaking voice, the, po the voice that I hear reading the poems when I'm working on them. Uh, it's the voice of both the adult and the child sim simultaneously uh, going over the language and figuring out how I'm going to partition the stuff in the past with the stuff that matters to me in the present. Uh, and, you know, when we talk about style, maybe we're also talking a little bit about voice. And it's and it's it's an important element because not that I want people to hear a poem and say, oh, that's got to be a Virgil poem or, you know, the way that, for example, Billy Collins, people know when they're hearing a Billy Collins poem or a Mary Oliver poem or what have you. Right. You begin to focus on that voice that is going to guide you through these words that you're putting together. And for me, the voice has always been kind of easy to tap into because it's sort of my childhood voice. It's the voice in my head that walks me back through. Mm -hmm. um, and more often than not, when I think of an image, it's often that voice that begins to connect the the sort of the, the again, the, the, the words that are going to take me through whatever the poem is about. And then the adult voice often is the voice that surprises me about something about the ending, you know, mm -hmm. um, that, um, so yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know how you develop a voice other than, you know, you, you work on your poems and you read them and you get used to that voice in your head that's speaking while you are writing. Because hmm. uh, that voice is always there, it seems. There's yeah. not, it's not going to go away. Do you, do you think of that voice as speaking to someone else or is it speaking to yourself when you write uh, that? Do you imagine the audience? Than, more often than not, I believe that I am actually speaking to myself, which is, you know, only poets can get away with <laughs> yeah. this because I do find myself um, more often than not, I'm, I'm recording my voice on my iPhone. And so I am literally talking to myself in the car about ideas or about things that I'm seeing. Right. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's the voice that I'm hearing. And then it's also the voice that's captured in the recording. And more often than not, I also write in my journals. So that's kind of a, it's a similar voice because once I go back and read it, it's it's still my voice. But, and I hate my voice, my actual voice. I can't stand it. So I always cringe when I, when I hear it back, but it does allow me to practice my uh, inflections, my the sort of the vernacular of speaking English with a slight accent still, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as I tell people, uh, who know me and I travel through the South, you know, the last thing I want is for anybody to ask me where I'm from. So more often than not, when I'm on the motorcycle, I have my cigar and I always talk to people with a cigar in my mouth because I, I, I do you have any, you know, I, I'm looking for some hot boiled peanuts, hot boiled peanuts, that kind of thing. And so nobody would dare ask me where I'm from because it's always terrifying to me. It's like, oh no, I, how much time do you have, right? <laughs> it's going to be a long story and, you know. Yeah, well, um, you, there's a lot of fascinating things to you. We haven't even we've been through a whole hour and haven't even gotten to uh, the the birds that you raised, and and that's the first appearance of the motorcycle. Um, <laughs> but but there, it seems like you really dive into things that you're passionate about, um, you know. And and poetry maybe is one of many things that you you jump into. Can you explain why uh, you were raising, I think, canaries, right? 
Well, I, w- I was. I gave I gave canaries up a long time ago. Uh, but I've always thrown myself at these hobbies because through doing something, I learn sort of the like I always tell my students, look, um, early on, I got my hands on a visual dictionary, which is a great tool to have because it's an exploded uh, view, right, of everything. Like, for example, uh, you say violin. Well, what is a violin? What are the parts of the violin? So having a visual dictionary tells you everything that you need to know. And for me, really diving into something um, helps because then I get to read up on it and I learn to read up on the history of like w- when the Canaries, mm-hmm. it was a whole world. And I've actually written very little yeah. about Canaries, but raising Canaries uh, really gave me a, a, a an immense respect for birds. I love birds, but these days I don't keep them in the cage. I mm-hmm. let let them be, you know. Yeah, I heard um, you. Uh, you said uh, that you wanted to, to learn about another species as well as you know humans. And so, right. Well, uh, you know, right. Um, so, so, what did you I, learn I, in, that, in that process? I kept. Yeah. Well, that we are actually every time you look at the animal world or anything in nature, you realize that we're actually the lesser. <laughs> we're the lesser creatures, right? Uh, at least that's what, with, with all of this ability to think and rationalize, we're really detrimental, right? We are a plague. I mean, you can listen to George Carlin on this. He explains it a lot better than I do. But we, we are scourge. You know, we, we are, a, a, you know, the, the way that I look at it is we're fleas on the planet. And eventually one day the earth is going to just shake us off. And I like that idea. But uh I mean, I, I like I like nature and I like uh, fauna because uh, fauna and flora because I I like looking at sort of that mystery. Uh, like I was in Guatemala not too long ago and I was looking at a bird of uh, a book of uh, hummingbirds, and I realized that there's a hummingbird called the black crown coquette. And that just that alone, I mean, I saw the picture, but the fact that somebody went out of their way to name a beautiful hummingbird, the black crown coquette. And I I understand the black crown because it does have a black crown. But what triggers me is the coquette. What is it about this hummingbird? that would be deemed coquettish, you know? So I just, and that's how I look upon subject matter, right? I stumble upon something and I just cannot let it go until I exhaust all these questions that I that I come up with. Uh, the other thing that helps, I was gonna say is, living in Tallahassee all these years, you know, my wife and I arrived young, we raised two children. Um, to me, it was never the ideal city. But over time, I'm glad. I mean, I called it shit city. I still call it shit city every once in a while. Uh, Because to me, it is. I grew up in L.A. I love big cities with a lot to do. But it's very it's a kind of a a, it's a um, out of the way little town, of course, is the capital. But what I've come to appreciate is the gift of time. The fact that there is nothing nothing going on other than for example when mickey faust which is this amazing uh theater uh, troupe um they perform i mean there are certain things right we go to concerts and stuff like that but normally it's not like la or new york where you could literally spend every hour going somewhere and feeding your head i like the fact that i'm in the woods it's quiet and i'm and i'm there to work Mm-hmm. Um, having already lived in the bigger cities, um, I, I I love that yeah. quiet and solitude, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why so. I moved up to the mountains myself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's let's do uh, one last poem. We're about out of time, but you want to do? Okay. You had grist, or is it gristle? Yeah, gristle, or you had uh, axiom yeah. of the outsider. Which one do you want to? Yeah, no. Let, let's do axiom of the outsider. Um, okay. And you know, uh, the, to plug rattle, right? I mean, rattle has always been the kind of magazine that. Uh, it's been very supportive, not only of young poets, uh, people who are starting out, but the fact that, you know, it, it is a landmark. And over time, even though, you know, in my case, for example, every few years, I think this poem might be good for Rattle or I'll send Rattle. So the fact that you guys are still around providing uh, a venue for a lot of young writers is fantastic. So uh, I'll, I'll read Axiom uh, and it's short and sweet. So. If I could just find it, it should be. Page 95, 95. 95, okay, I knew I had passed it. Yes, 
axiom of the outsider. Sometimes you surrender to your destiny, a scratched, torn cardboard suitcase, black as your shadow, places where travel seems uncertain, these dead hour porches, parasol snapped shut like the lips of your dead lover. What hardens in you keeps you hungry, though your tongue can no longer taste bitter coffee or recoil from a salted cracker. These are, in fact, the last days of your spent youth. Look at the tatter map if you must. Those lines converging can only spell trouble. The road ahead turns as dark as your days. Yeah, and that was Axiom the Outsider, published in uh, Rattle number 22, which was actually the first uh, issue of Rattle I worked on, so quite a while ago. And a great, great... Uh, coming home for that poem and then another one of these beautiful photographs next to it of the urban decay um once again the book we're talking about today was american chernobyl by virgil suarez and, and thanks so much for being a guest virgil it's been great talking to you, and, you and sharing this book and it's really an inspiration i think to people to, that you can self-publish this way you know there's a stigma on it um but you put out a beautiful book and uh i think people are going to see that and, and maybe learn that they could try it too yeah, well, uh, what I like to tell people is I've got nothing to prove. I mean, you read the work, you look at it, you either like it or you don't. I think that's usually the immediate uh, response when somebody looks at a painting or a photograph or reads a poem. Do you like it? That's fine. If you don't like it, then move on. Plenty plenty of others <laughs> out there practicing the craft. So, um, you know, I, I just i am very proud of, of my efforts uh with this book and i really love it uh, myself it pleases me first and more foremost and then if it pleases somebody else even better you know mm -hmm. yeah well thanks for meeting us it has been fun talking Thank to you too. and uh yeah i appreciate I, it and i hope we get to do it again you yeah. everybody take care definitely take care all right that was today's guest virgil suarez of course his newest book is uh american chernobyl which you can find at uh at uh Amazon.com because it's it's published there. So um, people were asking about that before, and uh, that's where you can find it. And so go ahead and follow that link to it. Um, and now it's gonna be time for open lines. And I forgot my normal screen, but I can share it this way. We can uh, put let's see, we can put this up right here. Email your poem first if you want to share a poem to open mic. That's open m i c at rattle.com. The prompt for this week was to make a mixed media poem. So you might be emailing me something more complicated than normal. Um, but I will then go and. Where do I shoot? Let's see, where am I? Hmm. Well, I will invite everybody in just a second. I think this screen, there it is. All right, so I got the invite link. I'm going to put it on a, on a, the chat windows. If you'd like to join us, just follow the Zoom. You'll, you'll be on the Zoom just like uh, Virgil was just then. But um, if you'd like to sit tight right where you are and watch uh, the poems and enjoy them, uh, feel free to not leave. Just stay on the YouTube or the Facebook. But if you want to share a poem, go to the Zoom, which I'm pasting in the chat windows right now and pinning to the top. And then email your poem to open mic. That's open M-I-C at rattle.com so we can show it on the screen as we uh, share the poems. And I'm going to be right back after a really quick break with uh, more open lines. So uh, sit tight and I will be right back. And we're back. Thanks for your patience. Like I said, the prompt for this week is to make a mixed media poem. 
And I did this thing. Uh, so you can do anything you want. It was inspired by last week's NFT Poets episode because a lot of those are video poems and, and, and GIFs and all sorts of things that are unusual as people experiment with what technology allows and, and how you can share poems in different ways. And so we thought we'd give, it, give the prompt to write something in mixed media. And what I came up with was this. Let me uh, let's see if I can do this right. And where did I put a file view? Yeah, okay, there we go. So this is my poem. And uh, hang on one second, where do I, let's see. While you're watching it on the screen now, where are the controls? There's the controls, okay, so here's the poem. This is a, what I call a distillation. And I thought of this while I was giving a uh, presentation um, at the Haiku North America conference. I just randomly, we, we'd gone to a distillery and we'd seen uh, the way whiskey is, is boiled down in that sort of layered still, it looks kind of like a clarinet. Uh, as Katie said, and uh, and I thought about the way you know haiku or poems too. They're just distilled into the smallest unit. So then I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to take poems you've written already and try to distill them into a haiku that's a little different than the poem itself, but contains the same words? So the people on the Zoom can't watch this; you'll have to watch it later. But there's a gif of this happening where the it's so it's really an erasure down into a haiku. And so I'll read the poem and then I'll read the haiku, I guess, as you can watch it go through. But this was Typical Day, which I wrote for the, the rattle, uh, Rattlecast like three months ago, maybe. Uh, this is Typical Day. They turned a corner, climbed some concrete stairs, and there it was, the park they'd never leave. It rose from the hill like a dream. There were people in frisbees. A dog chased a ball off its leash. The blossoms were blooming. The bees wove their way through the weeds. It had been quite the journey to get there. All the trains and the transfers, the tokens and turnstiles, the numbers and letters, the red and the blue and the green. Their feet were sore from the walking. Their shoulders were pink from the sun. It was a typical park from a distance, but they knew that it was the one. And then we'll let it filter down into the haiku as we pair away words. Uh, if you're only listening, you can't really see it. But here is the haiku that comes from that poem. A dream blossoms, the bees turn numb and green. A dream blossoms, the bees turn numb and green. That is the haiku that that poem distills down into. That was fun to do. I was going to release that as an NFT, actually, um, but I can't mint from this other location. So I have to be back at my, uh, my other computer to do that. But we'll do that later in the, in the week. But let's go to uh, some more poets on the open lines. And once again, if you uh, I'm going to put this, say this one more time, open, email your poem to openmic, that's openmic at rattle.com if you would like to share one and then join the Zoom link. Uh, let's go first to um, Andrea Gartner, or Angela Gartner, I should say. Sorry, Angela, I was looking at the corner of my eyes, Andrea. So uh, how are you doing, Angela? <laughs> Good. How, Tim? How are you doing, Tim? I'm doing great. Um, Good. I actually should change my name on this because I am Angela Russo Gartner, but true. I'll have to change it. <laughs> now that you're famous for having a poem on rattle.com a couple or last week. <laughs> yeah, that was really fun. And um, I'm just so um, honored to have poems in this issue because there's such so many great poets that are um, that are part of Rattle. So I'm just so excited to be here today um, as well because I haven't been on the open mic for a while, but it's been so busy this summer. So, but I, I try to I try to go. What's nice is you can go back and like listen, um, which is nice. It's all recorded. So. Yeah, hang on, let me see. I'm trying to fix one thing. But so so what poem did you have that you'd like to share? Well, I'm not as cool as everyone else. I'm I'm excited <laughs> to hear, you know, everyone's cool multimedia stuff, but I'm gonna do it's actually a poets respond poem from like a week ago, but I think it's still relevant. It's about um the the Supreme Court taking away the opportunity for the student loan forgiveness, which definitely impacts me as I'm still trying to finish my graduate degree this summer. So um, I would love, I would have loved to have a little bit of money back. That would have been really good. But, um, but I just, you know, it was when I, when I read that, it was just really, I didn't, I was hoping it would happen, but um and I didn't even apply, actually, because I thought it wouldn't anyway. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of disappointing to hear that it's not going to happen at this point either. Yeah, kind of a Charlie Brown the football. I remember that you know, single payer healthcare <laughs> same kind of thing, uh, unfortunately. But uh, but yeah, and, and a great reminder too that if anybody wants to share poems not on the uh, about the prompt, you please do because we want poets respond poems. We want 
publish things you published recently. I think I forgot to say that this time. So you don't have to have a, a prompt poem. Anything you want to share is great. And let's hear this one. What I could have bought with my student loan forgiveness. Go ahead. What I could have bought with my student loan forgiveness. I'm on my couch on a Friday looking at my paycheck balance. My phone calculator shows the dollar months I have to subtract for homework I did 10 years ago. I'm wondering if I missed the box to check for first to be legacy student status when I apply to the college scholarships. My 16 year old has almost finished his driving lessons. A car we promised has 100,000 miles with the check engine light on. The private school recruiter asked us to fill out financial papers. There wasn't enough zeros after the comma. Smoke from the Canadian wildfires has dissipated. The two fans in my living room circulate the dry heat as blades and the air conditioner has stopped working. The degree, the degree gets higher. I'm sweating as I look at my bank account. Someday I will die, but I hope the money I owe in loans won't follow me down in my grave. Yeah, great poem. Thanks so much for sharing, Angela. What I could have bought with my student loan forgiveness. Yeah, always a pleasure. Great, great seeing you again. Always a pleasure. Have a great day. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, you too. It was Angela Gartner. And now let's go to, um, let's go. We have, I should say too, we have uh, 14 people on the line. And so um, uh, we're going to have a one poem uh, minimum or, or I guess minimum two, <laughs> but a maximum of one poem. Let's go to Carla Schwartz next. Hi, Tim. Hey, Carla. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. And um, I I sent you a link. Do you know how to share video on um, on Zoom? Or would you um, like me to, me to do the sharing? Let's see. Well, I can just play it, uh, which is, probably works better. Um, oh, okay. But I could, is okay. that better if you share it? I mean, it's fine. I could do that, too. It's, there's definitely visuals as, associated with it. So, I mean, so you know what happens when you share a video on Zoom, mm -hmm. just as you're sharing on the bottom, it says optimize for a vid video. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that you have that set. And then um, for this one, just to save time, I would do it in 2x speed mm -hmm. and, and put the CC on and you'll get the, you'll get what you need. Okay, let's see if I can. <laughs> And I can do and okay, if, so I'm just gonna play it. Um, all right, but do it at two x speed. Two x speed, okay, and then put the closed captions on. I yeah, can do all okay. that, okay. Right. And now, um, and so so introduce this. So so okay. what what do you? What so are we this here? is a poem. This is uh, not a new poem. I wrote this poem, and it's in my first book, which is called Mother One More Thing. And the name of the poem is called Shrimp. And um, I performed this poem in uh in natick in 2015 massachusetts and um this woman who was a graphic designer said oh we have to do this with shadow poets puppets and so she uh d and we collaborated and she designed these shadow puppets and uh, we put it together and this is the video of that poem and oh i do vocals with this it's all vocalized improvised and also uh the piano is also uh, improvised. Oh, very okay. interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yes, yeah, so this is going to be about three and a half minutes, I guess, going f um, twice speed. So everybody uh, prepared to listen. And if you're on the Zoom, I'm, I'm sorry that you can't hear it, but I think it'll work better this way anyway because I don't have that those settings set up. So you're going to have to wait. Go go get a, a coffee or, or a drink break or uh, for a second or go, go back to the Zoom or Facebook to watch this. But here we go. This is a shrimp, a poetry puppetry music video by Carla Schwartz. Very interesting. I'm looking forward to hearing this. So, uh, so sit back and, and let's listen. Uh, here we go. First of all, I'm improvising on the piano and I'm improvising on the vocals. These poems appear in my book, which is called Mother One More Thing. This poem is called Shrimp, and I hope you enjoy it. We lived in a slab house, shingled and dark. We were renting back then. Mommy painted us. Umbrella was satin, just the right size for my hands. It was not really for rain, more a parasol. Powder blue umbrella in hand. I started to cross the street to Gina's.
I remember lying in the driveway. Mommy waiting impatiently for the ambulance that took forever. Then mommy holding my hand. Then the wheelchair. The hospital. The teeth shaken out of me. Being carried everywhere. Being carried everywhere for a week before I regained my balance. And the get well cards from nursery school. Later, a visit to the doctor. Supposed to check my hearing. Who put his hand so deep? I had to bury the memory. I never liked shrimp growing up. I never liked shrimp growing up. I thought it was because mommy only cooked it frozen. And it smelled like a frozen toilet. I thought it was because mommy only cooked it frozen. Later, mom said I used to love shrimp. Later, mom said I used to love shrimp when I was younger. And that the day I was hit by a car, I threw it up on the driveway. And after that, I wouldn't eat shrimp again. It was a long time before I knew shrimp didn't have to stink. I never told mom about the bad doctor. I never told mom about the bad doctor. By the time I remembered, I knew what it smelled like. And I didn't know what I remembered. Wow, that that was really cool. I, I love that. Yeah, you can stop the video there if you want. Um, yeah, th uh, thank you, Tim, for for sh letting me share that. Um, and uh, I had three other videos with shadow puppets from oh, that wow. performance. Yeah, that is that really. Are on I've my never challenge. seen shadow puppets done in, in such an interesting way. I've never. I don't know how I've never seen that before. But that was really neat. If anybody's watching on the Zoom and hasn't didn't see it or uh, watching just listening to the audio, find the uh, YouTube. Uh, and, and watch it later. But, but that, was, that was really fun. And, and singing the poem, too, uh, was pretty neat, too. Thank you. Thank you. And I think it works actually really well to X speed. But I will, um, I'll put a link in the chat. Yeah, put a link in, in the chat. In the, in, on YouTube. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. That was really fun. Thanks for sharing that. I'm glad we did the mixed media poems. It's already been a lot of fun. Thanks, Carla. Thank you. All right, there's Carla Schwartz with um, that, uh, let me see the title again, was... Um, Shrimp, a puppetry music video, or poetry puppetry music video. Very, very fascinating from 2015. Uh, thanks for sharing that again, Carla. And next, let's go to um, who's next? Dick Westheimer's next. Hey, Tim Green. Hey, Dick. How you doing? Good. It was a lovely, wonderful interview, and I really liked your um, your multimedia poem. I'm looking forward to going back and watching that again yeah, that, that was gonna be yeah it's gonna it's a lot of fun to do i think i'm gonna do that with a lot of poems i think maybe i'll do that every time i publish a poem and make it an nft after the fact i think that'd be fun to do so uh, anyway they're gonna call it distillation so if you if you do it yourself just use the same word because we have to we have to call join together and call it something right <laughs> okay distillation. so uh, so what is it that uh you'd like to share dick uh well I, i'm gonna pull out one of the uh um and it, NFT submissions I sent to to you back in January. Oh, very cool. Okay. And I just I emailed it to you. I emailed you a link to the NFT, but it's it's multimedia. I thought I'd uh, I'd give it an audience. <laughs> well, perfect. Yeah. So let's. Uh, well, the haiku. You know, we would violate the one poem rule, and you can share the haiku first. So uh, uh, so why don't you okay. pull the haiku up? Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, the haiku. Whoops, I just. 
Um, yeah, the haiku, I'll, I'll just read it um, if, you if you have it posted. Yeah, I have it right here. I'll try to make it a little smaller so we can see still. Um, but yeah, here's the, and it's, so it's for those just listening, there's a, um, an owl on a sort of a black background, um, a drawn. So where did that come from? Did you draw that owl? Dick? No, I found, I found, uh, an art and I manipulated it. Uh huh. Very you know, nice. it was sort of, yeah. you know, maybe a Peterson's guide or something like that. And I mm -hmm. just altered, altered the background to make it look like it was night. Mm -hmm. Well, very cool. Okay. So, so here, let's hear the haiku. Alone at night, the barred owl screeches. Alone yeah. at night, the barred owl screeches. Yes, yeah, so that is a, uh, a haiga, a combination of photography or shahai, as people, I guess, apparently um, in the haiku community, you know, haiga is a, is a tradition where uh, you paint or, or draw an image with a haiku. And so some people think you should call it something a little different when it's photography and call it shahai. But uh, that is an NFT. I'll put that on the screen too, um, right here. If anybody wants to buy that or go to uh, object.com, like we were talking about last week, and you can collect that as well, Alone at Night, the haiku by R.L. Westy, our own Dick Westheimer. Okay, and so the other one is the video, right, Dick? And so we'll... Yeah, it's the video. I'll just give it a quick update. You know, one, one of the things I've been grappling with within this NFT world is just sort of like... The vocabulary, the philosophy, sort of the whole, how it differs from ordinary, my ordinary poetry practice. And this one speaks a little bit to this notion of minting mm -hmm. or striking a coin, which is immutable. Mm -hmm. And so often, you know, I don't, you know, you have poets on Rattlecast who, who will read a poem that was in a book 10 years ago, and they'll read a version of it that has changed over time as they've come back to it or or even changes as they're mm -hmm. reading it yeah like pinsky i remember i was just looking at the pinsky interview not too long ago because that's going to come out on the radio and every poem every time he reads a poem it's different because he sort of just riffs on he kind of remembers it and then you know goes off on a tangent and kind of come pulls himself back and he, he says it's like jazz in the uh in the interview mm -hmm. and so um yeah it's, it's interesting that you know but once you mint it you can't do that that's for sure yeah, you know, and so often, you know, I'll be at a reading and I'm reading a poem and I'll come across a line and it will change as it's being read out loud. And mm -hmm. um, and I was reminded of sort of my artist, artist's way mentor, who was a painter who hung paintings, his own paintings in his home before they sold them. And if he was walking through with a paintbrush, no painting was safe. Um, yeah, so, that's a little <laughs> interesting. Well, you know, it's the same thing as, mm -hmm. as you'll see when you when when you when you play the poem. Okay, and here and once again, people on Zoom won't be able to hear it, so I'm sorry for that. But we'll just have to go back to the YouTube to see it. But here we go. This is uh, why I might never mint another poem as an NFT. Here we go. Why I might never mint another poem as an NFT. For Jose Cedillo's friend, mentor, artist, teacher. My friend Jose painted and painted and painted. He loved his paintings so much that his whole house was hung with them. Two nudes in the living room, a portrait of his wife combing her hair in the den. In the kitchen, an oil of an old man sitting on a box fiddling with his penis was displayed. In the bath, a guitar with flowers blooming from its sound hole. Jose always had a brush in hand, and when he walked from room to room, he would stop and fix things, adjust the old man's hand, or muss his wife's hair, or cover the breast of a nude. Once he made the guitar seem to sing with just a small daub of paint, and with a flick of his wrist, changed the old man's face from pain to pleasure. The touches were small, but made me gasp. How could you? I said when the artist defaced one of my faves. This one was perfect, that one sublime, and now I'll never see them the same way. Jose's smile broadened as if he touched up himself with the brush. My paintings are not coins, Ricardo. They are me, and I am never done. 
I hide the ones he's given me whenever he visits my home. Yeah, very fun video poem. Once again, that was why I might never mint another poem as an NFT. And uh, we can see here um, on the screen, you can go once again, object.com to find this and watch it anytime you want. Collect it if you would like, a little description there. Why? And then it's, I might uh, never mint. It's uh, R.L. Westy if you want to search for something. On, uh, where we go? There we go. That's uh, Richard's uh, handle there on objects. So thanks so much for sharing that, Richard. It's really fun. I don't know if you're gonna are gonna mint any more, but it's uh, it's been fun playing with it, hasn't it? Oh uh, yeah, it, and and it's been really fun. I hope other people sort of catch a little bit of the multimedia bug from the prompt you've given this week because it, it does add a dimension and yeah it's just fun i mean like i'm sure virgil would say i mean he plays with so many things and you know it's just something new to play with so so check it out yeah thanks for sharing that those dick yeah yep. thanks tim have a good night bye it was dick westheimer with uh the haiku and then uh why i might never mint another poem as an nft let's let's go to uh audrey friedman hi tim hey audrey how are you doing tonight Good. I hope you have the ability to play a PowerPoint. Let's see. Well, we can try. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Um, There's one thing uh, that I, you know, it's after I made this the prompt, I thought, am I in trouble? <laughs> okay. Let's see. Well, it looks like I can, um, I can scroll through these. So let's see. Maybe I can, let me see, maybe like this. The funny thing is I made mine, my distillation was a PowerPoint that I turned into a GIF. Okay, so we save it here. So everybody bear with me for one second. We're see okay, can... so I, I recorded the poems on the presentation and you just have to do, you know, start um, slideshow. Okay, let me uh, <laughs> slideshow, start from the first slide. That's it. Except I don't want to do that because I can't do full screen. Hmm. Let's see. So I'm trying to figure out how to do this. Uh, let's see. Can you share your screen? Can you do it on there? Maybe we should try it that way because this doesn't I have. have I, yeah. I hate to sound like a novice, but I know. <laughs> I've, I've never done a share screen. Well, it should be. Access is there, I think. Yeah. So do I have to pull up the PowerPoint first? Yeah, so pull out the PowerPoint because I don't. I'm not sure I can play the audio the way it's set okay. up because it, it it takes away. It has to go full screen in order for me to do it. So I think, um, yeah. Uh. And then you click on share screen. You can pick which one you want to share. Okay. And since it's not video, I think that'll be fine that way. Share screen. Okay. And now pull up the PowerPoint. Um, okay, hang on. Of course, I can't find the presentation. Let's see. Sorry. Open recent. Okay. Oh, you know, I might be able to, I might have fixed it. Let's see. Because now I, can, I found a, a setting. <laughs> It, okay, good. I, I hope. It, you... Yeah, I found a setting where I just keep it in the screen, which is what the problem was. So it's not full screen. Okay, so I have to stop. It. Okay, I, I've got it up. Put that down. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay, do you have it or do you want me to do it? I'd rather you did it. <laughs> I will. Okay. If you fail, I'll try. Okay, so I'm going to try. Here we go. This is going to be my attempt. Sorry for everybody who's delaying, you know, waiting for uh, for us to do this, but I'm going to try. We'll do the file view. There we go. And so now if I start slash, we'll turn on the audio first. <laughs> Sorry, I'm learning how to do this on the fly. That's so okay. bear with it, me. It was fun <laughs> to take my my original art and, you know, make it one with the poetry. Mm -hmm. so okay. Well, uh... I have a series of Tonka poems, all about the sea. Okay. Well, here we go. I'm gonna I'm gonna play it now. So just sit, it'll be everybody quiet for the Zoom, but it'll be uh, it'll be playing on YouTube again. Good. Okay. What the seas say.
The grumbling waters speak of too many secrets, tossed in waves to sink and be trapped in coral reefs, a jail to keep what we can't. On days when I can't make decisions, you instruct me to look moonward. Trust the ebbs and flows to lead me through rough seas to harbor. Yeah, hey, can you mute yourself for a second? I'm here in your. Uh... Oops. Yeah. Okay. And here's the last slide. Oops, that was the last slide. Oh, there's the last slide. Thesaurus of sea voices, barely a whisper, no sage words spoken. Do you wish for me to hush, to hear your prophecies? Yeah, so very cool. That was really fun to see a, a slideshow poem. Audrey, you can unmute yourself again now. Um, okay. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, so th that was really fascinating. So what was it like to put, you know, find art to put to your poem? And, and what do you think it adds to, to do it that way? Uh, well, I don't, I think it adds a whole other dimension. Um, you know, having, having a backdrop of, you know, again, a very personal interpretation of what I'm so drawn to. Um, it just ups the ante, um, than me. Yeah. It's more an impact. You have the visual and the oral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's very fun to do. I had fun playing with it myself. And it just makes you think of different ways to do, you know, what you might want to do with a poem, too. So it was, it was interesting to try. Thanks, Audrey. You're welcome. All right. And next, next go to, uh, let's go to Katie Dozier on the other side of the house. <laughs> hey, Katie, how you doing? Hello. Good. How are you? I'm glad you have enough bandwidth to have uh, be on Zoom while I'm streaming. It seems fine. <laughs> If it crashes, we'll know why. We will. But I really enjoyed enjoyed the conversation with Virgil Suarez, who was at FSU. He was one of my poetry professors, and he was like the cool professor. Like, <laughs> yes. he like, there he is on his motorcycle again. Everyone wanted me in his class. And we watched The Graduate in one of his classes. And then, you know, I had to go around listening to Simon and Garfunkel every time I was like in an airport. So <laughs> he made me a little cool for uh -huh. like a little bit. A little cool. Yeah, I could, I could definitely <laughs> see that happening. Uh, you know, he definitely seemed like the, the fun professor that you want to have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so what did you do for, uh, for your mixed media poem? So I was inspired because on the poetry space, we talked about Hyben this week or this past week and with Dave Bonta and at the Haiku Conference, his Hyben Film Festival. So I had to take uh, Hyben that I had published recently and utilized the blockchain to take a poem that I have the rights to again since it's in Frog Pond and the current issue and turn it into my first Hyben video poem. Interesting. Which is an NFT. So yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah it was uh, it was fascinating to watch that film festival. If you want to check out, um, I think his website is Dave Bonta dot com or something simple simple like that mm -hmm. uh and mm -hmm. also there's moving poems i think and so if you want to check mm -hmm. it out search for dave bonta moving poems you can find that the nine entries into this hyben film festival which is really neat to see the different ways people combine video and and hyben which is of course that prose poem with a short haiku at the end usually although they can be interspersed and mixed in different ways which we also learned in another presentation um <laughs> and, and so it's fascinating though to see what works like what you know what I, to me it felt like the, the capturing the mood with a video without being too literal or without being mm -hmm. too like well the poet's saying this then you show the you know right. it was the way that it worked best and so it sort of mm -hmm. it sort of built a mood for the poem and then you're sort of invited into this poetry landscape which i always i like those ones the best i think what about you yeah i think so i think for my next type in video i'm going to go for something that there's more of a cut between the actual poem itself and then what is displayed but i think that at least my my video puts you in the mood for the poem at least i mm -hmm. hope <laughs> well i'm going to play it right now and again people on the zoom aren't able to hear it sorry but uh that's the way it's going to be but go back and to youtube to watch it. and if you're only uh listening on the podcast later find the youtube to watch it but here is the video this is a uh, your seat cushion maybe used as a flotation device and uh it was from the current issue of frog pond another high bend. so here we go with Katie Dozier's piece right here. And we'll play it now. Back then we had to dress up to fly standby, 
sometimes winding up in first class, my sister and me in tights, pretending we might belong among the crystal salt and pepper shakers. I knew how to open a bulkhead tray table at nine without anyone ever having paid a fare for me, learn the endless loop of smiling and the power of saying yes, please. Play within a play, Ars Poetica is the haiku at the end, which, uh, so if you're only watching the, the audio, the prose part was read, and then the, um, and then the haiku was just on the screen, which I think that was one of the ways that the poems were presented at the festival that, that worked really well, I think, because there's, there's a cut between the, the prose section and the haiku, so I think it's an interesting way to do it. Yeah, and it creates another cut between what you're hearing and then what you're reading on the screen, too, which is a whole other layer. Like, I'm really excited about a video poem and their potential to add whole layers of meaning. So it's really fun to start exploring. Yeah, definitely fun. I'm glad we did this. Uh, I was really, I was, as soon as I said we'd do a mixed media uh, prompt, <laughs> I was like, oh, no. <laughs> what did I sign up for? Just trying to get all this work. But it's actually working that well, and uh, and it is fun to play with. So thanks for sharing that, Katie. And uh, thanks so much. yeah, thanks so much. Thanks. All right, that was Katie Dozier with your seat cushion may be used as a flotation device, which once again, you can find um, on Object, uh, and you find KHD over on Object, and Object is, um, I'll put that on the screen too, it's objkt.com, so go there and, and type in KHD as your, your author, and you will find this video poem, which you can watch at your leisure. Okay, so let's go on to another Open Lines caller, and Barbara Tyler is here. Hey, Barbara. That's me. Yeah, that's Hi. you. How are you doing tonight? Yeah. Okay, how are you? I'm doing great. Uh, so what do you have to share? I, I drew Virgil. Oh, that's so, oh, wow, that is really good. <laughs> I wish I could draw like that. That is amazing. Okay. So I my visuals are old-fashioned. Uh-huh. I'm just going to hold them up for you while I read the. <laughs> oh, that's really wonderful. Okay. So, yeah. so that's nice because everybody can, can look at them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it definitely is. Okay. <clears throat> Map making. Mm -hmm. Colonizing cartographers in small boats glide into every inlet of every lake and river, hugging shores until their contour drawings are recorded and sent off to faraway places already crowded with commerce. How did these, those who hid in the old growth forest, cautiously watching these small new boats make maps of their own? Was it oral tradition, rites of passage, important places handed down on a need to know basis? Atop bound sticks, small shells, become islands. Their every contour not as important as where they anchor in a vast ocean. Water is in constant change and yet patterns emerge, hypnotize, comfort. Why does the artist Vija Selmans use graphite only to map its fluid nature? Sitting in a small boat quiet on the water, I begin to hear voices telling me how to find my way. We find our way a different way. We find our way just fine. Oh, that was great. Thanks so much for sharing that. And it was really nice to uh, have the old fashioned way of holding them up so I could <laughs> show them on screen. We flipped to the poem sometimes and shared the, uh, and shared the visual sometimes too. It worked out really nice. Thanks for sharing that, Barbara. That was a very nice poem. Too. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, yeah, so that was uh, Barbara Tyler with map making, and uh, once again, if you're watching, you know, find the YouTube video because it's really fun to see these uh, and not just listen. Although it's great to listen to. Let's go to Mike Bales next. Uh, good evening. I sent you the poem about a week ago. Uh -huh. I thought you were on at night, but I caught you during the day. Some of it. Yeah. Um, I I like this NFT thing. Um, I wrote some short things that I'd hope to turn into. And we mentioned video poems, too, and I know one project that a bunch of us were involved in like a couple years ago is called Telebooth Poetry, uh -huh. where we recorded poems. The Midwest Writing Center had recording, a recording facility, so I recorded three poems down there, and one was selected. 
and the recordings would be available for the people. You'd go to a small telephone booth. This is in Council Bluffs. Then I think it moved to Dubuque. Oh, that's interesting. And each poem had a phone number assigned to it. So you'd dial that phone number and hear that poem. Um, I heard they're doing it again. I'm going to have to check that out. Hmm. But, yeah, well, that's very interesting, Mike. Um, I sent this a couple, well, last Monday. Was uh, it the Ode like to the, the Electric Fan? Right. This is a Ode poem prompt. Mm -hmm. So here's Ode to the Electric Fan. Okay. It stands in the corner of my room, head bent forward as if in contemplation. While I check my emails and ponder what songs I sang last night. Living on a quiet side street, I'm learning to live again after spending long days controlling traffic on shoulders of highways all around Iowa, Wisconsin, Nebraska, South Dakota, and Minnesota. And now I'm back home. Two days ago, the fan sang as it sliced the air, and, and in solitude sat in the front room, I was bent over my laptop in an aura of light, writing stories and poems possessed by night. This morning, birds sing outside my window, stop, and the air grows sultry and still as my roommate trudges through the room looking for a folder he lost and asks when I could move, something we discussed the other day. I yell, I yell back when my chest hurts for a moment, and I think about how my life could be disrupted when compelled to start over again, and how the rents in the area I've risen and how I've struggled to find a good place to live. The fan is still, its head bent forward while I'm searching for lines and verse lingering in my head before they are lost. Today I'm greeted by resonant sounds of the recycling truck on its every other Tuesday rounds as a day interjects itself into contemplations as if life itself is a play. Yeah, very nice. Thanks so much for sharing that, Mike. Uh, that was uh, Ode to the Electric Fan, which was the prompt uh, last week. So we had Ode to uh, an object inside the room you're in. And that, that was the first. We had like an electrical outlet. We had uh, some other things like that. And uh, we got the Ode to the Fan now, which definitely uh, with the heat in this, <laughs> this summer, it's a good thing to have. Thanks for sharing that, Mike. Thanks. Yep. Have a good night. So I'm Mike Bales once again. And let's go next to Spartacos and Agnostris. Hello. Hey, Spartacus, how are you tonight? I'm really well, and a really interesting conversation tonight. Thank you. Yeah, it was fun to, to talk to him. So, uh, let's see. Oh, you have an you have a uh, NFT, too. Yeah, I, I just experimented with Haiku and uh, photography, mm -hmm. so I've created the aging him to youth. Did, did you... Uh, so let me put it on the screen. Sorry, I've, got, but... I've, got, uh, I've got it on the Word document also as a photo and a text. Yeah, well, I have it here too, so we can see it on uh, on the screen. Uh, it, mm -hmm. So, is this the first time you did an NFT after listening to the NFT episode last week? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! Uh, so, and, how uh, hard was it for you to set up? Um, a bit confusing, but you know, st uh, learning. Yeah, yeah, definitely something to learn. That's great. So, this is on OpenSea. Um, OpenSea.io is the website, and uh, I'll put mm -hmm. it up on screen. And then, uh, yeah, go ahead and read. So, it's three haiku with a photograph for people who are. Just listening, it's a, uh, a sunset photograph. So here we go with the image. And go ahead and read it, Spartacus. Mm -hmm. Festive riverside, an extinguished dream, skips the birthday cake. Sleeping infant, a butterfly lands on the perfect wings. Summer solstice, a soft murmur roars above the flutter. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that middle one, especially sleeping infant, a butterfly lands on the perfect wings. That's beautiful. Yeah, thanks so much. This is really neat to see that you uh, pulled off the NFT just and took a week. <laughs> it's great to... Uh, yeah, yeah. Lo love it. And th thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Spartacos. And again, it's uh, Spartacos and Agnostris. If you want to find this, you can uh, go to OpenSea.io and you have it here owned by CE42C5. Uh, the aging him to youth. So search for that and you'll find this piece here. Really need to see. Thanks for sharing that once again, Spartacus. All right. And next go next to Emily D. Ferrari. 
Hi, Tim. How are you? I'm I guess great. you're fine. <laughs> I've heard you say it so many times. <laughs> yeah, I definitely am. Do you want to tip your thing down? Because we have your eyes again. Again. How's that? <laughs> there you go. That's better. Yeah, great to all see right. you. So what do you have uh, to share? Well, I've been so impressed by all this multimedia stuff. And I just want to say I tried. It didn't work. <laughs> well, that's okay. I mean, I... <laughs> You know, it's weird because I try a lot of experimental stuff too, but I just like, I'm sort of like an old fashioned, like Luddite in a lot of ways. Like I just want like books in a quiet room yeah. or maybe like walking through the woods with nothing. And and so uh, I, I definitely yeah. appreciate yeah. <laughs> not doing multimedia things. So what do you have to share though instead? Uh, I have a, a poem. It's a, um, a poet's response. Mm-hmm. And, and what inspired it? Um, the, uh, the incursion of Israel into the refugee camp in Janine, mm -hmm. uh, and a couple of other things that were happening here in Pittsburgh. The photograph I was going to use behind this poem was a picture of our Christopher Columbus statue that has been covered since, um, there was a campaign to remove it. And so the city covered it. Oh, wow. Hmm. And it's been covered for about three years. And um, some folks who think that we shouldn't get rid of it have uncovered everything except its head. Oh, so it just yeah. has the shroud on its head. Oh, wow. And a friend of mine took a great pic. <laughs> yeah. A friend of mine took a great picture of it. And I was going to use that, but it just didn't happen. <laughs> well, that's all right. <laughs> it's resurfacing, right, is the title? Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, why don't you go ahead? I'll, I'll put it up. Thanks. Resurfacing. The Peruvian woman ran out of Piatiti to rescue her merchandise from the dust, kip, kicked up by the grinding of Murray Avenue, and I said, lots of dust. And she gathered her dresses and gave the construction crew a dirty look before retreating behind and closing her door. I thought of you chatting with me beside your rack of summer dresses outside your shop in Hebron under the wire grate above our heads through which came hurling a well-placed sluice of mucky water over you, me, and all the flowered cotton. We looked up and you cursed as the woman with the kerchief wrapped round her hair tied at the nape of her neck gave one final fling to empty the residue in her bucket on us. Walking home, I repassed Piatiti, the asphalt grinding machine having moved on, greet the Peruvian woman sweeping the sidewalk, her dress racks ready to roll out. I continue past the Christopher Columbus statue, unshrouded except for his head, leaving him as executioner or condemned. We all get to pick when we think about Columbus conquistadors, the Clotilda wounded knee, the West Bank, and Ruined Dresses. Oh, beautiful poem. Great details on that resurfacing. Thanks so much for sharing that, Emily. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And I'm going to scoot back over so I can <laughs> hear these. <laughs> okay, sounds good. There's Emily right. D. Ferrari. See, thanks. Yes, take care. Thanks. Emily D. Ferrari with um, Resurfacing. Uh, next up, let's go to Joe Cottonwood. Okay. Hey, Come on. Yeah, you're good. Hey, Joe. How are you doing today? Uh, hi. Hi. Um, Gosh, I, it, this barely qualifies as multimedia. Well, whatever. Anything works, I think. So so what do you have? Well, I sent it to you. I don't know whether you can display it yeah. in a photo. Mm -hmm. I do, just for the viewers not on the Zoom. But yeah, yeah. So describe yeah. it. Well, it's, it's a photo of the electric toothbrush, which I keep sitting on my desk in front of the window in my office because my wife banned it from the bathroom. <laughs> That's funny. Well, you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant, so hopefully it's got some direct sunlight there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's fine. I, you know, the assignment the week before was to write an ode to an everyday object. So mm -hmm. um, my eyes lit on the toothbrush, and I ended up, and I realized it, as I was finishing the poem that I was actually writing about myself, not about the toothbrush. So anyway, here it is. Oh, great, yeah. Um. Ode to a Phillips Sonicare toothbrush. Mr. Phillips, how faithfully you stand at attention in your recharging cradle on my desktop, banished from the bathroom by my wife, not for your phallic design, but 
for not matching the decor of plush, rust-color towels. How patiently you wait for the two minutes twice a day when you enter my flower petal lips as bumblebee in my overcrowded mouth to buzz my gums and scrub my enamel without pollen for reward. Two short shifts of work, long breaks to enjoy all the passive entertainment coming at the window, angry Robin attacking his reflection, banana slug sucking a path across the glass, spider on a thread dancing the eight step, monumental redwood, a model of perfect mental health. Each a soul like you and me with days defined of work and nights of rest and recharge, with the occasional bang, wear and tear, scars of a life measured not by happy or sad, a life predetermined by how we are built, a life to be praised as useful, for which I give thanks. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, great poem. And it's fascinating how, you know, the subconscious just sort of makes you come around and talk about something. So I, odes yeah, are always yeah. interesting to read. That was um, Ode to my Philips Sonicare Toothbrush. And then there's the photo on screen. Definitely a multimedia poem uh, in a different style. Thanks so much for sharing that, Joe. Thank you. Is, uh, Joe Cottonwood once again with uh, that ode. And next, let's go to Carolyn Codd. Hi, Carolyn. How are you today? I think if you can get closer to the microphone, I'll get it as loud as I can. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, this is also uh, uh, from the prompt about O uh -huh. from a couple of weeks ago, and it's um, about two objects in my, two related objects. And actually, you can see one of them over my head. Oh, yeah. Uh, you might not be able to identify it. but Oh, is that the, uh, what is it? The, the painting, you mean? A Native American Ah, mm -hmm. that's the title to the two Native American women in my room they're here displayed up on the wall the smaller one framed doing gathering work in a beautiful but inhospitable landscape the larger one unframed is at leisure perhaps some kind of princess with her robes and jeweled necklace I honor both of you symbols of part of my ancestry I find myself like the two of you alternating between gathering and leisure. Thank you for being there and here. You're beautiful. Nguyen Kowa, thank you very much. Oh, that was great. And another uh, multimedia poem that we can see yeah, that's a, almost as much. That's how much we can see um, a lot of yeah. it in the background. So now it's definitely a multimedia poem now that we've made yeah. it on video and combined the artwork. <laughs> very cool. Thanks so much for sharing that, Carolyn. Always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Yep. Good night. Yeah. Uh, Carolyn Codd with to the native to the two native american women in my room uh zachary honeycutt is up next hey tim how's it going man great how you doing zachary doing great maybe i should say what's up because everyone asks you how you're doing that's a good thing what's up well tim? you yeah. know it's a it's a pleasantry and it's nice to be pleasant so yeah but what's <laughs> up is we're doing a rattle cast last as i heard <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh, yeah so what do you got to share for with us Okay, I probably did the laziest NFT, and That's I just what people used keep it. saying, but there's interesting stuff. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I just used this picture of this uh, very displeased, upset. Looks like they're stressed out of their mind. Mother bird here. Oh wow, that that is some photograph. Wow, <laughs> that bird. <laughs> I mean, you got to watch on on YouTube to see it, but that bird definitely looks stressed out. I think that's like the true depiction of a mother bird. It's not always pleasant and happy. Sometimes you just got to get through it one day at a time. <laughs> yeah. Wow. All right. And then but, the poem here. Yeah. Mother bird. Yes. I tried to be a traditional like fiddler on the roof and keep to my traditions. So this is a traditional Zachary Honeycutt rhyming uh, Italian sonnet poem. Ah, interesting. Looking forward to it. Go ahead. Yeah. Mother bird. Nature always taught me that mothers know how to nurture and care for their offspring. Like mother bird born away in barking to scour and pick apart layers of snow. Mother bird scans the mountains high and low, searching for earthworms and critters that sting. 
Her eagle eyes lock onto everything. To feed her chicks, she knows she's got to grow. Mother bird flew back and filled her fine fowl, staying to coo another paragon as the paradigm of the perfect nest. The truth? Mom could and would not see my scowl, yet still blind as a chick to herself and gone, and left him to scream without warmth, song, or rest. Yeah, very cool. Yes. Thanks for sharing that. And Mother Bird, and again, I always love hearing the rhyme and the meter going. We always wish there were more <laughs> of that in Rattle. Thanks for sharing that, Zachary. Yeah, no problem. And a very cool see you photo, too. Next. Yep. See you later. Thank Take you. Care. Yeah, <laughs> see you guys next week. All right. So, <laughs> Zachary Honeycutt with, uh, with uh, Mother Bird. What is it called? Yeah, just Mother Bird's the title. Thanks, Zachary. <laughs> All right. And then uh, let's see. Uh, Mark Freiberg is <laughs> next. And meet yourself now, Zach, too. Hey, thank you. I got Say, you. Uh, it's good to be back for my second Rattlecast, not on a moving car, so things should go better. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. I, somehow you seem a little more stable tonight. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, uh, not emotionally. But it, what I'm going to do is something. Barbara held up a picture. I'm just going to hold up my little Bose speaker. Okay. And then we can avoid any technology problems. Uh, this came along your prompt just at the right time because I'd been listening to a beautiful Southern Appalachian dulcimer song. It was uh, performed and written by the late David Schnaufer, one of the virtuosos of Appalachian dulcimer music. His title was Morning Birds, but when I heard it, I thought more of drops of rain hmm. and the drip, drip, drip after rain, but uh, I got birds involved in it too. It's, it's short, let me make sure I can play it and see if it will come up. If not, I'll shift gears for you. Here we go. Can you hear that? Yep. Droplet rhythms after rain, off branches, pergola vines, glistening leaves, concentric ripples in patio puddles, Taps from the eaves, drum beats on the tin roof, sparkling symphony of splash, invite to birdsong. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. Reflection on morning birds, Mark Freiberg. Yeah, I hear the music in the background. I wonder if Good. YouTube's going to notice <laughs> who the music was. We'll find out. Thanks for sharing that, Mark. A real pleasure. All right, thank you. Yep. It's past my bedtime, pal. I got to go. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> All right, sounds well. Thanks for staying up late with us, Mark. That was Mark Freiberg once again with uh, Reflection on Morning Birds. And let's uh, go. We have a couple people left. Um, uh, Gianthi, your sound's not connected, so like, you may have to redo something like happens occasionally. Let's go to Bishwajit Mishra in the meantime. Hi, Tim. Hey, Bishwajit. How are you doing tonight? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. Uh, uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah, I do. So, uh, so what do you have to share with us? Yeah, I, I, I can't technically call it a prompt poem, but I saw the prompt today and uh, it, it, it's a half ass attempt. So I just sent you, it's called Cho Cherry Tea. Well, I like, I like this. Uh, it reminds me of uh, the, the, one of my favorite books to teaching my kids to read was I Dream of Trees which is, uh, you just they have all these different kind of trees and a really well-rhymed <laughs> poem going through it. And uh, this reminds me of it. So I'll show it on screen, the choke cherry tree. And I, I, I was wondering if it could be something like the prompt to come for next week based on the poet today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So choke cherry tree. Your almost dead branches still hold on to some snow in winter. And that makes a good picture against the white mounds in the park, three-story townhomes around, and your neighbors like the catacomb I once visited in a southern city. And probably that's how I noticed you for the first time in a crowd. Then you resurrect as a sage from the Himalayas, enlightened to spread your gains, going from bud to bud, leaf to leaf, then flowers, which are gone in a week, without any trailing scent, hardly noticed, non-following, except some odd one who might just be drawn to the chance exclusivity of the pictures like a new addict. Then, when the wind down seems imminent, leaves turn reddish, and little fruits start showing up, 
growing to red, a large city coming up over the catacomb, finally, before real shedding begins. You keep busy the whole of spring and summer, but does anyone notice, except some dogs ridding themselves of their saline effluence onto your trunk, and nobody wants your fruit, except worms, birds, maybe rabbits, and except some absent-minded squishing them waiting for someone, and you had been in the park by your side. Someone might have sat down under your shade, but you are no good by the road, except for some worms, birds, rabbits, odd dog, or that odd picture frick trying to recreate on another plane in case that finds better luck maybe for the self, another choke cherry tree. Then I guess that might be worth it all to leave. Oh, that's great. I love that ending. Thanks for sharing that. That was a choke cherry tree. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love yeah, the pictures too. Yeah, I have been, for some reason, I have developed this <laughs> interest now, and I followed this tree from, uh, and it, it's amazingly, within a week I saw one bird came, and mm -hmm. that's one of the pictures you can see. And within a week, it was it was full of leaves, and within the next week, it was all white with flowers, oh, wow. and they're changing the color. And I don't know if you can see at the bottom uh, of the uh, page, mm -hmm. there's again some green ones budding. <laughs> yeah, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> like a maverick or something. <laughs> oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, very interesting yeah. photos, a uh, little series there. Thanks for sharing yeah. that, Choke Cherry Tree. Uh, thank you, thank you, yep. Tim. Have a good night. <laughs> yep, you too. That was uh, Choke thank Cherry you. Tree by Bishwajit Mishra. And uh, let's go to uh, Jayanti. Let's see if uh, the audio can connect. Hey, Jayanti. Hi. Hi, Tim. Can Hi. you hear me? I can. Hello. Good to see you tonight. Good to see you too. Fascinating, fascinating. Everything, every time there's something so new, <laughs> and this mixed media, it's amazing. Do Do you have my haiku with you? I, I do. Yeah, right here. So this is another haiga or a shahai, if uh, <laughs> depending on your <laughs> persuasion. And this is uh -huh. a yeah. So it's a photograph of of a, a flower in a vase, a very large blooming flower. For uh, yeah. everybody who's just listening, and um, is there anything you want to say about it, or just read the haiku? Um, no, I'm not able to bring it up. Um, okay, well, I have it for everybody at home, so you, they can see it now. This photograph. Uh, go ahead and read your haiku then. No, I cannot read it because. Uh, oh, <laughs> okay. I, I cannot open it. Uh, no, no problem. I'll read it then. A shriveled okay. bulb. A shriveled bulb. Sorry, a shriveled bulb throughout winter hibernation. Stages a ballistic move. Yeah, very cool. Or is that movement? Movement, sorry. A shriveled bulb throughout winter hibernation stages a ballistic movement. I love that. That is great, ballistic movement at the end. Thanks so much for sharing that and a beautiful picture too. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. It was a Christmas gift and uh, it, it, it's sort of amazing how one small bulb, a small bloom, can fill your house. I know. I mean, that is the biggest, that, I mean, that is the biggest flower I've ever seen, I think. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank right. you. Yeah. Thanks so much. So, yeah. Uh, Janthi Rangan, once again, with a haiku there. And now we have a Lucy Chow. Are you there, Lucy? I'm, I'm here. Hello, Tim. Hi, Lucy. How are you doing tonight? I'm great. And... I have been traveling the previous week and it was a fascinating trip and I'm glad to be back in Radicast again. Yeah, it was great to have you back. So um, I'm not really that kind of NFT person either mm -hmm. <laughs> as um, many people claim to be today. But mm -hmm. um, in the spirit of um, what I have been traveling to see like these fascinating plants in these botanical gardens mm -hmm. I've visited and also um, I found a new love in an art gallery and I'm really struck by these large scale flower paintings of Georgia O'Keeffe and so I decided to do some overridings of her large scale flower paintings and mm -hmm. 
um, because I so admire the way she um, utilizes um, these amazing colors and calligraphic lines to express the character and presence of these plants to engage the, the attention of the human viewer. So I also um, tried to write over her paintings um, while utilizing the forms and colors of my letters to mm -hmm. further explore those possibilities while um, while I tried to inter interweave these elements with the with the texts themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, and also because um, O'Keefe herself says that to engage in nature with a full body, you need not only to um, engage with the colors and forms, but also with the voices and sounds of uh, the presences and the beings in nature. So I'm also thinking about the way that my reading voice can contribute to these um, word paintings. So interesting. Yeah. So let's hear them. So I have the uh, the iris on the screen right now. If you want to read that. So, um, the 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 blue one or the pink one? The the purple bluish one. Yeah. Okay. So encounter iris peering into. Iris, a mutual growing glow. Yeah, that's beautiful. I like I like the combination of the text and the uh, and the visual art. That's really neat. So, I guess I will read the the one called "Lights Touch" next. Mm -hmm. Blur of brilliance, grazed by your beard's gaze, I feel like. A filament of light, infinitesimally filigreed. Oh yeah, very dear. These combinations of uh, of the the haiku and the the poem are really nice. Okay. And then um, the the third one, I don't um, really recognize the species of this flower, but I'm struck by the intricate texture of this flower, and I'm imagining how it would feel to be a bee tumbling into this flower. So. Honey Han, to tumble into this territory, oh, what delight. Uh, that's great, too. Yeah, thanks so much. These are wonderful. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that was Lucy Chow with uh, three um, Haiga. And um, that is it for the open lines. So it's time to wrap up the show. But thanks, everybody, for participating. It's, it's, it's some time. There, there are a few people, a lot of people, who emailed poems, too. Uh, but we're not going to get to any this week. Uh, i got to shut down the Zoom. It is getting to be about that time. Um, so let's go over to the Saiku for the week. And the Saiku for the week is based on this article um, from the University College London. And uh, I always like to find, I, I always interested in anthropology and, and things like that. And so here is a new find. And let me put it on screen so everybody can see as much as possible. Giant stone artifacts uh, found on rare Ice Age site in Kent. And so they have these massive hand axes. And the fascinating thing, I mean, hand axes, um, it, it was our, our first tool was the hand axe. And we started making hand axes like 2 million years ago. And it took a, a million years for us to make a fancier hand axe. <laughs> and we started to make a little fancier one that didn't change for 500,000 years. But uh, 300,000 years ago in the United Kingdom, they had these massive hand axes, which are uh, I think 20, 29 centimeters long. You can see it uh, in the, the woman, if you're watching, how big that is. And that's so big that you, you can't really, I mean, it's hard to imagine somebody actually using it, you know, as a tool. You know, they're, they're knives we used to cut meat and things like that. Um, how would you even use a hand axe that big? So the, the theory is possibly they're uh, ceremonial, like the chief would have the big hand axe or something like that. Uh, but nobody really knows uh, what these giant hand axes were. Uh, they're some of the largest found in the United Kingdom, though. 
And um, the other interesting thing is this was actually found underneath a Roman burial site where most of the people were cremated. So there's sort of two cemeteries together. And so that was the inspiration for this Saiku, this article, uh, Giant Stone Artifacts Found on Rare Ice Age Site in Kent. And the uh, Saiku was this, if I can find it. Yeah, here we go. All the bones beneath the cemetery, dead languages. All the bones beneath the cemetery, dead languages. That is your Saiku for the week, and that is your show for the week. Thanks, everybody, for joining me. It's been a lot of fun um, being coming to you live from the Woodlands, Texas. We'll be here next week, too. And next week's guest, well, actually, let me tell you who the, uh, <laughs> what the prompt is going to be for next week first. Then we'll do the guest. So prompt first, then guest. The prompt for next week is going to be this. Uh, write a glossa set in the distant future. So this is kind of inspired a little bit by uh, Virgil Suarez's work. Um, and a glossa, if you don't know the form, it's going to be a fun experiment working on it. A glossa takes four lines uh, from some poet. And I think, I think, I mean, traditionally it's four. I think you could do it as many as you want. But take a few lines from a poet, and then you have to make each stanza end with that line. So it's kind of a cento a little bit where you're taking the lines are kind of like a golden shovel, kind of like the combination of a golden shovel in a cento <laughs> I'm in a poem. We have a great one by, um, you know what, maybe I should share that. We have, we have like one minute left for before I like to go. Let me share that poem. It's by Diane Seuss, the, of course, uh, the Pulitzer Prize winner from recently. Um, and I could pull it up and then you can see a cento. Then I don't have to explain it. And I should have thought of that ahead of time. So let's see. Uh, right? Don't, doesn't she have a cento? in rattle let's see maybe i'm misremembering it but i thought she did let's see I'm trying to pull this up yeah gloss she called it gloss which is probably why i remember it <laughs> okay and uh actually i could just have diane read it for you let me have diane seuss read you her sento glossa and you can see how the form works and then then we'll wrap it up after that so here's diane seuss's sento glossa Glossa, how miserable I am, he muttered. My God, how miserable. And joy gave way to the boredom of everyday life and the feeling of irrevocable loss. Chekhov. He took to reading Chekhov late at night and studied up on Fox Talbot and Callotypes. Watched the History Channel, anything on Lincoln or the Civil War, Caligula, who cut off tongues and fucked his sister. After Chekhov, he'd head downstairs, putter with a model plane, or pull the lint out of the dryer screen. Sometimes lie fetal on the couch, make toast, unbuttered. How miserable I am, he muttered. Why Chekhov and not Kafka or Conrad? Why Talbot and not Daguerre? Lincoln and not Adams or FDR, John Wilkes Booth and not Leon Chogus or Charles Guiteau. Why model planes and not carve decoys in the attic? All the while he was affable and focused, building a wooden box camera and writing an early history of photography. Grief like photographs, inerasable. My God, how miserable. I'm thinking back on childhood. He sucked his fingers, not his thumb. He seemed happy, but had trouble sleeping, afraid of the dark. Aren't all children afraid of the dark? Only later came the other things, the unspeakable. It reminds me of that deer we hit, the knife my then-husband took to its throat, as men do, letting one brand of suffering cancel out another. That deer was a door to years of grief, and joy gave way to the boredom of everyday life. Chekhov's stories are essentially plotless. Mirsky wrote, they are a biography of a mood, and Chekhov himself hoped to write with the objectivity of a chemist. Bored, he traveled 5,000 miles, 3,000 in a rickety carriage drawn by horse to the penal colony on Sakhalin Island. Chekhov 
in ill health, suffering, trotting his way through wilderness toward imprisoned sufferers, all to cross paths with the feeling of irrevocable loss. That was Dan Seuss with uh, Glossa. Um, and then, of course, you, uh, you see in the epigram that she takes that quote from the epigram, how miserable I am, he muttered, my God, how miserable, and joy gave way to the boredom of everyday life and the feeling of irrevocable loss. And so she actually took it from a non-poem. It was just a quote from Chekhov from uh, Typhus. But you see how those lines are the last lines of each stanza, and she rhymes them, but you don't have to. So the point is to sort of pull a story out of, of lines of poetry. If you want to do four, that's the standard, I think. Um, but you can do as many lines as you want. So you can do a couplet, or you can do three or four or five lines, make them the epigraph, and then you have to have stanzas where each stanza ends with one of those lines. So you're building a new poem, and then write it about the future. Um, I was almost going to say a post-apocalyptic poem, but I don't want to limit it to like some kind of a negative thing. But think about the distant future and write a glossa, or glossa. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but that's what you should do. That is going to be your prompt for next week. And next week's guest from the Rattlecast is going to be Sasha Style. Wait, no, that's not the right guest. Hang on a second. I put the wrong one up. <laughs> Sasha Style's in two weeks. Next week's guest in the Rattlecast is going to be da, 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 Bruce Weigel. <laughs> Um, Bruce, of course, one of the most preeminent uh, Vietnam War era poets. Uh, His most recent book is Among Elms in Ambush. He has two poems in the current issue of Rattle. Just a wonderful poet, a wonderful human being and champion of poetry, uh, a veteran from that war. Uh, Rattlecast number 202 with a glossa as the prompt. That's going to be Monday, July 17th. The same time as always, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, right here. Rattlecast number 202. Hope to see you there. Hope you have a great week in the meantime, and I will talk to you later. Good night.